Good evening, everyone. Welcome to tonight's episode of Profound States. We have a very special guest, Ellie Keith. Uh, she is a conscious channel. She has clear telepathic, automatic <clears throat> writing communication with 27 beings that she channels. Most of them are her parallel counterparts. Um, she's met 27 of them and is in contact uh, with them when appropriate. She doesn't channel any of these at this time for others. Uh, 19 of the 27 are ETs. She only voice channels three for others. Um, she's had, uh, she's energetically been in the control room of two spacecraft and saw one that was close by and stayed close to the ground for about 20 minutes while four friends and her talked telepathically to those on board and uh, seven of the of the ones she channels are from the star are from the star system Sirius. Three are from the are on the Sirius Council of Thirteen. Um, and I'm not going to go through all the ones she channels. It would take me way too long to to just give an introduction. She <coughs> has so many um, beings that she channels, and there's so many details about each of them. That I could spend quite a bit of time going over them, but I want to welcome to tonight's show, Ellie Keith. Thank you for being on my show. Oh, thank you for having me. Um, so, um, you sound like you prefer Lily Stargazer over the rest of the people, of the beings that you channel. I know that each being has its own special purpose uh, coming through you, but uh, for some reason, Lily stands out even among the many that you uh, channel. Why Why is she your number one? Well, it isn't that she's my number one. It's just uh, uh, that uh, there's more of a concentration uh, right at this moment. Uh, I also channel uh, Dr. James Simon, an energy healing doctor from the future. And I've done a lot, a lot of channelings with him. And and. I, I do the three, uh, Lily and Dr. James Simon and Dr. Julian Michaels, who is a vet, okay? Uh, and it's not that I do, I just want to concentrate a little bit on, on Lily because she is having people come to the inn, uh, at the Tavern in the Inn, uh, in Port Dublin, Ireland, and 700 years upline from us. Uh, 2723, and I've had many experiences with her, but uh, it's uh, contact time, and so um, there's a little bit more concentration with her um, to come to the inn, meet your uh, future selves. Um, people are going there just like I have and uh, met some of mine, and they're going there to connect with uh, the hybrids. She is a hybrid, uh, a human hybrid. And so the the push, you know, uh, uh, you know Bashar, right? Yes. Uh, Channeled by Daryl Anka. Yes. Okay. Well, I've been with him for since uh, Daryl started channeling, but anyway, there uh, he's really into you know the contact, and so is everybody looking forward to uh, you know when actually uh, you know the hybrids and that are among other ones are going to be landing. So it, it's come to the inn, uh, meet Lily, uh, meet uh, people have met, uh, they've gone on, on their own spacecraft when, when they're there. Um, they have, I met uh, uh, Dr. Simon uh, there uh, back in 2018. That's how I got introduced to him when I went to the inn. So uh, that, that's, the only, that's the only thing right now for Lily. So, uh, when you say it's contact time, um, people have predi been predicting that for quite some time. What what do you see as the actual time frame? It it's obviously very flexible, but uh, is it less flexible now, or how do you see it? Yeah, for any of those, uh, any of you who have um, been. Uh, listening to Bashar, which is one of the main ones that I've been with for many, many years. Um, yeah, he is He is saying, well, in this year, we're supposed to start more. Remember back in, I don't know if you remember, back in 1997, 
with uh, the Phoenix Lights? Yeah, I'm familiar with the Phoenix Lights. I, right. Uh, just I listened to. I was at a um, New Fork meeting. New, new uh, I forgot what that stands for. Anyway, Peter Davenport, who has the reporting center, at, used to have uh, National UFO Reporting Center meetings in his area, and there was a guy he had there who witnessed uh, the craft over Phoenix, and what he said was that he was driving down the freeway and the craft was <laughs> paralleling him and then he turned off the freeway and went perpendicular to the freeway and the craft turned and stayed parallel with him so it wasn't a according to the witness that i heard it wasn't a static craft that just happened to show up in one space and everybody saw it and then it left it uh from what i've heard it went all over the state Right. And even within Phoenix itself, it moved around quite a bit. And so uh, that's my understanding of that craft. But go ahead with your. Uh, well, I believe it's uh, I think it's Lynn. Is it Lynn Cattell? K I'm, Kitai. K OK, um, she's the been the main front runner all these years. And she still has uh, talks about it and has meetings about it and conferences on it and everything. Uh, so she uh, is the forefront of for my information, um, you know, for the craft. Um, and then the, that was the icon one was what they call the boomerang, uh, V shaped ship. Sure. Okay. And a lot of the, um, uh, children, the, the hybrid children, uh, that will be among the first to land, uh, were on that ship. And uh, a couple of uh, the children, I'm not a, uh, I'm ducty, I'm a contactee, so, but I have uh, several children that were on the ship at that time that uh, are my counterparts. I'm not the mother of them, but they're my counterparts. And um, anyway, what I was pointing out is that that was the largest uh, broadcast uh, contact that we've had uh, so far because that was uh, thousands of people across the the world had seen uh, and it was broadcast on the major you know CBS NBC um, studio at that period of time um, how um, you you channel 27 beings <laughs> Mm -hmm. They're okay. all all 27 are your counterparts or how many no. of them are your counterparts? Well, um, okay. Or other selves, I should say. How many of them are your other selves? The majority of them, um, without going through a list. Okay, are, that's fine. But, that's fine. But some uh, of them are, they are the, uh, like, um, uh, in, in Sirius, okay, there are seven beings from Sirius that I channel, but um, there are two, uh, Zeon, who is the, well, that's actually Bashar's counterpart, but my counterpart is the daughter, Arya, okay? And then there's also O, who is also the father, and my counterpart is Sean, the daughter, and then the rest of them are my actual counterparts. Um, you have such a large panoply of, of beings that you channel. I don't know how you keep them all straight. Well, it just, uh, some of them uh, are, I'm in contact with more than others. I have an actual uh, spiritual um, group that um, probably about seven or eight that are, you know, I'm constantly in contact with and telepathically. And it, it comes and goes. It depends on, uh, you know, what comes forefront uh, uh, or not. Um, they've all contacted me uh, throughout the years. And uh, so it's been very, very interesting. Uh, uh, some are from, the three of them are from Essasani. And uh, like Lydia, she's a first contact specialist, okay, has her own scout, scout craft, like... Um, like Bashar's, 
and then uh, Relia. Now, Relia is a first contact specialist like Lily, but she is, are you familiar with Willa Hillikersing? Who? No. Okay. Uh, I don't know if you, any if your people are really into Bashar or not, but uh, Bashar also channels Willa Hillikersing. How many and, how many people does uh, Daryl Aika channel? Oh, for the most part, uh, the ones that it really brings forth uh, Bashar, and then Bashar brings through has in the past brought through Willa Hillikersing. Willa Hillikersing uh, lives in uh, the same timeline as Lily Stargazer, and they are friends. And Lily Stargazer owns the Stargazer Inn, and that's uh, uh, in Port Dublin, Ireland, okay? But in the year 2723. And um, so I've been always felt, I've talked to, to Willa many, many times uh, when Bashar has uh, brought her through, okay, <clears throat> in in his regular uh, conference channelings and that. And um, she just recently, just in January of this year, uh, when I went to the inn, then uh, Lily entered, I met Willa Hillicressing, which uh, her, she's the counterpart uh, to Jacinta. She's the mother and my counterpart is Jacinta, her daughter. Makes sense. Um, so um, I've heard of the Yael and I've heard of the Sasani. Mm -hmm. Can you compare the two and kind of give the audience who is not familiar with these two races uh, your understanding of the Yael and the Sasani? Well, Sasani is uh, the the planet although they're they're mostly not on the planet they're in uh, spacecraft um, and that is Bashar's civilization um, they're like we see Bashar we think of Bashar like maybe being 300 years in our future but because of his their vibrational frequency it's more like 3,000 years okay and uh, Bashar uh, like I said channeled by Daryl Anka uh, has been, Daryl's been channeling him for 40 years. And um, so they will not be the first to land, but uh, Bashar has really acted as a, um, a con really preparing us for contact all these years. He's the one that has brought forth all the information, the hybrids and, and introduced us to it through these 40 years. So tell what about the Yael? Well, the Yael, uh, they're a civilization, and they will be um, uh, the the children will be the first to land from the Yael. They were the ones that uh, were on the uh, prominently on the um, spacecraft from the uh, Phoenix Lights. Um, don't know a lot about uh, that civilization, but. Uh, they um, they are really coming forth now. A, a lot of people um, are channeling the Yael and the hybrid children. So why are they the first to land? Is it because they're part human? Yes, they're the ones from our uh, abduction. And they're the closest uh, to us. Uh, the children will land. They actually, um, Bashar is saying that the Pleiadians will be among the first to land. But the uh, the children, the hybrid children, uh, and we're talking, Bashar is talking about maybe, he says the most, let's say around 2000, uh, you know, there's no prediction of it, but the time frame uh, might be around 2040. Uh, that that starts. Oh, so it's um, very close in our seventeen years, years is still a ways away, though. Yeah, but it's pretty close when you stop to think about it. Um, let me give you an example. When I I um, met Dr. Simon, I told you I went to uh, I went to the inn because uh, Lily uh, started. Um, I met her in, in 2016, okay? 
but uh, I didn't start. I, I started voice channeling her, but I was channeling her at the time, uh, and she was working with clients for until 2019 uh, with uh, people's belief systems and how they can change their life by changing their beliefs. Um, pretty much so what you know Bashar has been talking and dealing with us for with our beliefs for all of these years also. So that was sort of her specialty at that time. And then uh, found out that uh, she also owns the Stargazer Inn. And that was in 2000, uh, around July of 2019. And so the we went to, we started switching to the... Um, um, to the inn and taking people to the inn. And then Dr. Simon took over. Uh, he's an energy healer, but then he also took over for w working with people uh, with their emotional state and, and beliefs in that too. So um, when you channel people, do you, um, do you, do you remember do they totally take over and you're, you know, outside the body kind of looking at your body or how does it actually work that when you, and the type of channeling you do, how does it, how is your experience of the channeling? Um, being a conscious channel, I'm totally there. I hear everything that's going on. Um, I'm just sort of set aside. Uh, but no, I'm, I completely hear everything. Um, but they just, uh, come through and, uh, uh, it's all in my voice. I don't have different voices for the three of them. Um, but they come through and uh, just start talking like you and I are talking. And, uh, you know. And how is it decided who who will speak? Oh, it, it just depends on uh, what the uh, the clients are asking for. If they want a... Uh, want to go to the inn and, and uh, talk to Lily Stargazer, then we set up appointments for her. And if they have health issues, uh, and then they want to speak to uh, Dr. Simon. And then I have Dr. Michaels is a vet, uh, and he works with the animals. And so it's the distinct, they all have their own distinct things. So when the clients have those issues, then that's who comes through them. So it's the person who speaks is totally in reference to what the client needs. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so you say that seven of the ones you channel are from the star system Sirius. What do you, um, what do you understand about that star system? I haven't really. Um, my concentration has not gone into. Uh, when I say that I, I'm in contact and I uh, channel, I'm like, oh. Uh, is from Sirius. He's the first one I started channeling oh, about 35 years ago. And um, he contacted me um, when I got home from uh, being out dancing one night and I sat down and I could feel uh, someone around me. So I asked who was there and he introduced himself. And um, he was, he presents himself as a a fourth density and a sixth density being. Uh, the fourth density being had a spacecraft, which was uh, just above the house at the time. I energetically then went on his craft and he just showed me around. Okay. But I haven't, uh, I, and I, I done, I've done a lot of uh, channelings for myself with him, automatic writing and this kind of thing through the years. Um, so that's that happens a lot, and also Zeon. Uh, Zeon is uh, oh, just in the recent years, uh, probably the last six years or so, um, and so he's a, a major one. But I, since I'm not concentrating on bringing them forth for other people, any of the uh, other than the three that I talked to you about. Right. Uh, then there is um, my concentration is on the three that I'm doing, and that takes up, uh, you know, a good my good days, uh, you know, for for that kind of channeling. So, uh, three of your beings are on the Syrian Council of Thirteen. What do you know right. about that that council? Well, the Syrian Council of Thirteen, um, in the years past, they have uh, been in contact you know, telepathically in that they've worked with earth and they've brought through ideas on agriculture and, and, uh, technology and, and 
Uh, I asked, uh, I don't know a lot about the, is, uh, the 13, the, that's um, console, uh, only because I haven't, again, delved into it. Um, but the little that I do know is that they, uh, you know, brought forth uh, many different uh, um, ways uh, to us through channeling through, you know, through people throughout the years. So I've heard that the Sasani were, is a hybrid race of the future created from human gray uh, hybrids. Is that right? Is that accurate? Right. Yeah. Okay, so how far into the future is the Sasani race? He said it's like 300 years in the future, but energetically, they're 3,000. Is that what did I say it correctly? Yeah, with with Bashar's uh, yeah civilization uh, for Sasani. Yeah, the he said that their vibrational frequency is so high uh, that if he showed up today, and um, you you know we're we're not really ready for that kind of vibrational frequency it would it would just totally put us in psychic shock with their vibrational frequency that's why through all of these years he's been preparing uh preparing us uh not only for Esasani, but many of the other beings that will be coming and landing and and working among us but the hybrids will be the first ones that uh and the Pleiades, because the Pleiades are the um, closest, those and the um, the hybrids, of course, are the closest uh, human-like to us. So but the Sasani uh, is from a different timeline than the one we're on, yes? Yes, absolutely. They're in a different dimensional shift, yeah. Okay, so I must assume that the Sasani can easily go laterally from dimension to dimension or time our timeline to tim timeline i'm sorry oh yeah i mean bashar is the first contact specialist and he works just like with us um as a first contact specialist with other civilizations and bringing them into the uh the association that we will be joining uh you know in in the years to come uh, so he prepares the civilization, uh, talks with them, and the best way to do that is through like a channel with Darrow, who is uh, what one would is his counterpart self, or if you look at it, it'd be his past self if you want to look at past self. But since everything uh, exists now, there is no past or present. There just is now. Um, but if you want to look at Daryl as a past self and his as the future self, they always, first contact specialist always has a uh, person like him or like uh, with uh, Lydia or uh, really uh, they have uh, people uh, in on earth so that uh, they contact and work through, like with Daryl, works through Daryl uh, to get the message out and the training that he's done, preparing us for when he's going to be here. I started to say that um, when I first uh, met uh, Dr. Simon, uh, well, I had, I was talking, I'm back up here. In 2019, I was at a Bashar conference and um, I had, I told you I had my own um, contact in uh, no, 1990. Uh, I had, um, I thought it would be fun uh, and it was about June or July of 1990. And I thought it'd be fun to take uh, four of my friends and said, hey, why don't we go to the desert? Uh, I live in Southern California. And why don't we go to the desert and see if we can see a UFO? And they said, yeah, that sounds like fun. So we headed out. <clears throat> I believe it was Palmdale. It, it took us uh, probably about an hour and a half to get there. Uh, today it's very built up. But back then it was, um, you know, lots of vacant uh, land. Uh, and one of the women, as I recall, she, owned, she either owned a piece of property uh, or she knew of somebody. And so we headed to that particular uh, plot of uh, land in the desert, nothing around but desert. And there was a fire pit there and we brought wood, we brought chairs, 
We're making a party out of it. We brought drink, food, uh, the whole thing. And so we got there, I think, about 1130 at night. And so we are sitting there just uh, drinking and talking and having a good time with no expectations uh, uh, that we would see anything. And then a ship showed up. And the ship is the regular disc shape, which I understand uh, is the uh, the gray their ship with the lights that go all the way around. And uh, it looks like windows that go all the way around it. Are you familiar with the ship I'm talking about, the disc shape? Uh, well, I'm familiar with disc shaped craft. I've had my own encounters with disc shaped craft, but they weren't probably not like what you're thinking about. But uh, I, um, in any case, go. Uh, <clears throat> oh, so anyway, so it uh, it just hovered very close to the ground. I can't tell you how. I mean, it was up quite close. I mean, it was a ways away, but it was, and I don't even know how many yards or, or feet or anything it was away. It was uh, uh, up close is what I can say. And then it just hovered there. And... <clears throat> So then myself and another uh, another woman, another of my friends, uh, we could both talk telepathically uh, with beings. And so and I don't remember today, you know, 1990 was many years ago. Don't remember what uh, uh, was said. But uh, so we talked telepathically with them, uh, the ones on board. And they hung, hung there for about 20 minutes or so and then just took off. Uh, and then we finished, uh, you know, and then we were talking and excited and everything. And uh, then we left there after. But the interesting thing is, other than um, the man that I had recently met who became, uh, became my husband, uh, I had told Fred. Uh, he knew that I was going, of course. Um, and then the four of us. But I never spoke about it uh, after the encounter afterwards, which... Um, you know, just it was pretty exciting until and I had never mentioned it to Bashar. I never asked him about it until uh, I think it was about September uh, of 2019 when I was talking to him at the conference. And I brought it up and he's the one that I thought it was a Palladian ship. He said it was from the Greys, but he said uh, and I said, what about, you know, the reason for it? Well, there was a contact on board uh, on that ship. OK, that um, is as I, I have learned now that it's because uh, I'm in contact with him in the last oh, about year and a half or so uh, is I take. But what what Bashar told me is that it's the Greys, but he said it's a very special faction of the Greys. And when I asked him to tell me more now, I've been going to Bashar, like I said, I, I knew Daryl when he first started channeling Bashar and uh, and Daryl's a you know a friend and and through the years and everything but um, I uh, I I, when I I've never heard him say to anybody or to me what he did that night he said to me I can't tell you in public and it was okay. And so that was the, I talked to him about Dr. Simon and other things, but that was the only, the first time I've ever brought up to him about uh, seeing the ship in 1990. Uh, so that was the end of the conversation about that. And uh, he said, I'd have to do it in private. Well, anyway, um, I told Daryl about it after the session. And I said, if he contacts you, because Daryl has gotten messages uh, from like Lily a couple times for me. And, you know, because of the association with, with Willa and Lily, they're so very close in the same timeline and everything, good friends. But I said, if you get information, let me know. And he said, I will. So I figured I'd get a download of information. Uh, I didn't, uh, I and I don't, um, be forward with trying to get the information or seeking it out. I just let it go and knowing that uh, I'll get the information or the contact when I need to. So it was, wasn't until um, December of that year and I had not heard anything. But then I was back uh, in Bashar in December and I was speaking with him at the time. And um, <clears throat> he, 
he had no, no, I'm sorry. I wasn't speaking with him, but a woman was speaking with him just in regular conversation when they're asking questions within the conference. <clears throat> and <clears throat> during that time, he telepathically said to me, you couldn't come to me, so I will come to you. And uh, he would, uh, you know, give me that information. Well, it was, I think, a couple of days or the next day or a couple of days later, that's when the uh, gray that he said was a special faction of the grays contacted me. And then, like I said, I found out that he is Zytec. And <clears throat> now Zytec being a very special faction. Oh, I did ask Zytec at first. I said, why did Bashar say that he couldn't uh, tell me in uh, uh, public? And he said, because we asked him not to, because the information was just for you. And uh, <clears throat> so that that was the reason for that. But anyway, um, they are, um, Zytec is from a race of being. They're known as the Coco Akaluka. And it's a civilization in the Andromeda galaxy. Uh, so that's his very special. And I haven't done a lot with Zytec. Uh, again, uh, it might seem strange to you, but uh, I've got all of these different beings, but I can only channel and spend so many hours a day, uh, you know, with the ones coming forth to, uh, uh, you know, speak with others. And in the future, I probably will be uh, bringing Zytec through. So, but uh, at, let me ask you at that time, the same time, uh, I'll back up the same time in, in, in 2019, uh, in September, when I was talking to Bashar, first talking to him about it, I asked him uh, if they had landed, meaning Bashar had landed, uh, because in 2065 is uh, probably screwing up your timeline here but dr simon at that period of time when i was talking to him he when i met him it was 2018 for me and 2065 for him so i when i was talking about dr simon i had asked bashar if he had landed in uh by uh well by 2066 and he said yes they have landed I asked him if he landed before 2066, and he said it's it's in flux, and so he couldn't give that timeline. So if 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 they start uh, some of the hybrids that are going to be living among us and everything, let's say 2040, 2045, uh, Dr. Simon is a human, uh, and he is uh, 47 years. Uh, he lives in Colorado, 47 years uh, in our future, and he has met. Uh, Bashar at the time. Um, so when you say this, the uh, co co Coco, Coco Akaluka, Akula, Ak Akaluka I'm yeah, sorry. Coco name. Akaluka, right. Uh, civilization from Andromeda is a special uh, faction of the Greys. Right. Do you know what that means when you say special? No, when when Bashar talks about a special faction, I think what his distinction is that it isn't uh, like from the abduction. We always connect the greys from our abduction uh, period when they produce the uh, hybrids. I think that's the distinction. And he's not even in our galaxy. Um. The timeline that the Sasani is on and our timeline, do you know, um, can you contrast these two timelines in any fashion? No, I'm not really uh, into, uh, you know, the Sasani and other than Bashar uh, and this. I mean, this this is not forefront of uh, who I'm talking to or, uh, you know, my... Um, my interest in in my interest is mostly in the the ones that I'm channeling. Uh, I I love meeting everybody that I have, and uh, uh, but to you know I'm not an expert in Essasani. Uh, there are people that I'm not channeling anybody from Essasani. I have two two uh, counterparts from Essasani, but I'm not channeling them for anybody else. So I don't spend my time talking to them. Uh, you know, about 
what they're doing or Esasani or any of that. Do you understand? Yeah, sure. So yeah. Um, I don't expect you to have the answers to every question I ask you. That's not, <laughs> I, I don't expect that. Yeah. Just say, I don't know. <laughs> You're fine. Uh, so the the three main people that you channel, doc, Dr. James Simon, Dr. Julian Michaels, and Lily Stargazer, they all, are, are they all uh, living in that one space in 2723 or, or did I, do I have it all confused? Oh, only Lily Stargazer. Only Lily she Stargazer. Does. Yeah, she's in Port Dublin in, in 2000, uh, 2723, uh, just like uh, Willa Hill Christing. Uh, like I said, they're good friends. And so Lily owns the, the Stargazer Inn. And uh, so people have been going to the tavern, uh, you know, to meet her. Uh, Dr. Simon uh, has an enlightenment center in Colorado uh, in the in the year 2070. Okay, and he's an energy healing doctor that I've been working with uh, since 2018. And then Dr. Michaels, Julian Michaels, he's a vet. Now he, uh, I channel him like I said for the animals, and he lives at the enlightenment center with uh, Dr. Simon, and also. I channel, not for others, but uh, Dr. Alicio. And Dr. Alicio is from the Yale civilization. And I've been in contact, of course, with her. And, and she's a counterpart self. Uh, Dr. Uh, Simon and Dr. Alicio are my counterpart selves. Um, and they live at the center, in, at the Enlightenment Center in 2070. In Colorado. In Colorado, yeah. So, uh, so you've gone to 2017, you've gone to 27, 23, you've gone to all these future um, timeline or future um, points of reference on the earth. Can you describe anything about these places? Uh, not just the, like the centers they're in, but the world at large, can you describe anything about the world at large in 2070 or 2723? No. Nope. Um, in uh, Colorado, it's, uh, you know, I mean, that's right here, in, you know, only 47 years from now. Um, so it's, it's pretty much this, well, after the landing and everything, uh, you know, some of the uh, terrain and that has changed um, but I don't concentrate on what the surroundings is or done ask Dr. Simon about uh, you know what it's like uh, I've, I have a description uh, of his office uh, his enlightenment center uh, and, uh, you know, it's very beautiful. He's by the mountains and it has a, uh, a little lake and, uh, uh, where they all work, uh, out of in, in Colorado, but I haven't gone into the, you know, surrounding areas or anything because, um, there. So, so do you know where, where in Colorado, uh, the Enlightenment Center is? It is, um, not far from Denver. North or uh, south, east or west of Denver? Mm, if you don't know, that's fine. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I'm going on memory here when I have, I have asked him about it because he is um, actually in a town that doesn't exist in our timeline. Oh, right? really? Yeah. And, uh, oh, it's with... Um, Oh gosh, in my memory here, it's with a is it's named after a specific flower that's so, very abundant so, in his timeline. So this year 2070 is not our 2070; it's a different timeline. No, it it you, everything exists now. You you're understanding that, correct? Well. Because we couldn't talk to, uh, we couldn't talk to, like you, uh, you know, you've met uh, beings and everything, and I couldn't talk to any of them. We couldn't be talking to Bashar or anybody else if if they didn't, if our lives weren't simultaneous. Right, right. I, so I got you. So it's our year 2070, but 
uh, we're not, you know, in that timeline yet. We're in 2023. I, I get you. So, um, in their so timeline, in his timeline, the landing has happened, you know, probably in somewhere in the 2040s. When we right. say that that Bashar has landed in 2066, that's our year, 2066. That's not very long from now. And my, it seems like a long time, but it's, that's not very long the way time goes by so fast. I got you. So yeah. um, it seems like you've laid out the people that you channel, where they're at, and sort of what they do. Um, how would you like to proceed with our, you know, I'm, I I don't even know which direction to go with all this because there's so many different pieces of it. And, um, and I know that you don't know, you can't get into a description of all these different beings because you don't sit and have conversations with them. You have them work with your clients. I understand all that, but that, doesn't leave me with a lot of direction to go. Well, OK, when uh, when I first um, to me, going to the inn, going to the tavern at the inn. All right. Uh, is very exciting. And what uh, and, and people are going there, uh, you know, for the last uh, three years or so, uh, other people have been taking uh, visits. I take them on visits to the end and you're energetically at the, t I give you a description. This is how it happens. Uh, I have a complete, cause I, when I went to the tavern at the inn, and then I came back and I have a complete description of what the inn looks like. Okay. And so when somebody wants to, as a client, they want to say, I want to go to the inn. I provide them with that description. Like if I gave you a description of what my living room looked like, OK, you could picture it, right? Uh, maybe I'm, <laughs> the problem. The problem is, is I can't uh, I, I I'm one of those rare people who has no ability to uh, visualize. So. OK, then let me put it this way. When you're reading a book and uh, when you're reading a book and you get a description and uh, uh, about my about the living room and and uh, as you come into the door, uh, you know, through the door and it looks like that and it has this in it and that when you're reading that book, doesn't that conjure up uh, uh, your being there? Can't can't you uh, you don't visualize what I mean, get a feeling for what that looks like without. Well, having yeah, I get a feeling visual? for it, but it's not a it's not a visual thing. OK, but it doesn't have to be visual it, using your imagination. Your imagination is re very real. Sure. And so when I give people the very, I mean, very, very detailed description of what the inn looks like, OK, uh, then they are sitting or lying down, just like with myself. I'll start with myself. And I usually am on my recliner chair. And then I just, and I'm not a super visual person either. I see by feeling. And I always have, but I can see by feeling. Um, so when I then I when I first started going to the inn, then she would start. Uh, that was to get me used to seeing in her timeline. OK, and uh, then. I met I, I saw different uh, I met different hybrid uh, people. I met some other people. Like I said, I, I met. Um, I think Dr. Simon was the major person that I first met at the inn. And this was very interesting because when uh, we when I went with Lily uh, this particular time uh, there, we were the only ones there because when you go to the inn, she brings in the people that uh, not the people, but the beings that uh, for you to meet. OK, and I'll tell you about some of the other experiences for for what they've had. But uh, this particular time uh, when I met him, then it was a uh, June what 2018. Uh, she said, I saw nine uh, symbols uh, about, you know, sacred symbols, uh, 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 sort of like floating uh, by the wall. OK, when I when I sat down and we we're just in the middle of the room and so she, you know, like triangles and squares and this type of thing are, are sacred symbols and geometric symbols. And so she said, pick one out 
and tell me, uh, you know, how you feel about that. So I picked out the Tesseract. You know what a Tesseract is? Uh, I know how it's portrayed in the Marvel Cinematic Universe. There you go. A Tesseract is a fourth dimensional uh, symbol or fourth dimensional uh yeah, symbol. But the way we see it, one of the ways most of us see it is uh, we relate to it is a cube within a cube. And then that cube within a cube, each there's there's very facets. They're just all these facets and they're all different dimensional doorways. Um, I'm very familiar with the Tesseract. I don't want to get off script here, but I had... Uh, I had a, a dream about a Tesseract uh, back in 1997. And uh, do you want to hear about that, about the Tesseract? I want to hear about anything you want to talk about. <laughs> okay. So uh, I'll divert here, but it, it, it helps explain the Tesseract a little bit. Um, in February of 1997, I had this dream. And in the dream, I was a male um, scientist I was at a military facility, and it was like on a Saturday, and there was uh, in the dream, uh, and there was, I described was either a uh, short person or a child, okay, that was there with me. And my project, uh, when I went in the room, my project, uh, when I walked in the room, was this very, very large box, okay? And when I looked into the box, I could see crisscross dimensional uh, dimensions within the box. So uh, then I was talking to, this is when we're, uh, Bashar was just meeting with, uh, oh, maybe 20, 25 of us, and, and we met uh, a couple times a week, okay? So right after that, I asked Bashar, and I was telling him about my dream. And when I said box, he said tesseract. And I'd never heard of a tesseract. And so he said, you know, think of it as a, a, um, a cube within a cube. And uh, so anyway, then uh, as we went on through the ensuing weeks, when, when the group of us were, were meeting once or twice a week, all right, he said, build, build your a little tesseract. And so uh, I brought in a tesseract and uh, it was a wire diagram that one of my friends had made and I had wrapped it in green uh, tape and everything. So I brought that in and we start talking about the Tesseract and, and he said this dimensional doorway, it's one where, uh, you can uh, walk through. And he said, it's like, um, bringing, it's like going in, uh, oh, let's back up a minute. Cause the, the, the child that let's say child or small adult, okay, went into the box in my dream. Okay. And he brought back lots of money. And uh, so when when Bashar was talking about it in the ensuing weeks and that, he said, just like he brought back money, he said, you can go back. It just had mentioned doorway and you can bring back, you can actually bring back physical things from it. Uh, I've never done that, uh, but I've had something taken from me, a uh, physical thing taken from me through the doorway. Um, but anyway... The uh, so he said it's just going into your kitchen and picking up an apple and bringing it back. So uh, this went on from February. We all talked about it, and uh, um, so in uh, I think it was July that year, uh, I had 45 people with a come to a friend of mine's house, and we gave a tesseract. Uh, Bashar came. We had a party, and we asked him questions, and we had dinner and all this kind of stuff. But then, but Bashar came in about. Dale came in and channeled Bashar at about uh, seven o'clock that evening, and it was all about the tesseract. And well, he also also talked about the all the other sacred symbols, and you know, because there's quite a few of them. And uh, so that's what what that was about uh, was about the tesseract. So. Uh, and when I was getting ready for the party, um, I lived in a two-story house and at the time. And when you came in the doorway to, the, to your right was the living room. And then it circled around to the, uh, the kitchen and, and family room. And then to the right was uh, my office and uh, 
there was a small bathroom, just a half bath, and then my office. Okay, and then you'd go upstairs. So anyway, when I was cleaning the house, getting ready for the Tesseract uh, event, um, I had, because there was no windows and everything in this uh, little bathroom. Now, we had two ba full baths upstairs that people also went to, but, you know, most of them were going to the small bathroom. So I got a uh, vanilla incense and there was a little potted plant uh, on the corner. And so I lit it just to see, because I'm not really into uh, incense and that, but I like the smell of vanilla. But I wanted to, um, I lit it to see, you know, if I liked it. And so it, I had just lit it. Uh, and you know how incense burns very, very slowly. I just lit it and the telephone rang. So I went out and went into my, a few steps into my office. And it was just a, you know, like, a minute, not even a minute phone call. Um, and then I came back in and it had disappeared. I mean, it didn't burn down. It didn't, it was stuck in the plant. There was nowhere to, for it to go. It had totally disappeared. Okay. Uh, and then we had the Tesseract. I put another one in and we had the Tesseract party and it was fabulous. <clears throat> so that next week when I talked to Bashar, and I was telling him about how that had disappeared. And he said, well, he said, that was to show you that the door goes both ways. And so another of my beings uh, had come through and had physically taken the incense. And so that was just to show me how the door goes both ways uh, in the Tesseract. So, so go ahead. How many... How many uh counterparts that you know do you have or to yourself how many other parts of you that, that you know you can say there's x number how many of them are there well of the 27 i would think probably about uh oh well, maybe 20 of our, our counterpart selves so does 18, 20 does 18, yeah. does the how many counterparts does the do you think the average human in ballpark would have. Oh, I think I think there are many. I mean, we make you know we make connections to our counterpart selves, or you want to call them future selves. Okay, that's easier for people to understand. Uh, to our future selves, um, you know, all the time you get messages from them. You might get it through intuition, you know, the gut feeling, and uh, you know, and, and my understanding from Ashar is that you know there can be hundreds or you know thousands and they live uh you know in many different uh on different planets and different time frames and and the whole thing many i just happen to you know they've contacted me but you have to have a reason um in your life you know everything has to be relevant in your life uh you know why they all have contacted me so you you've had uh unlike most people you've had direct interaction with your counterparts because you needed them for your helping your clients well it 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 just turned out to be that way i mean that's what it evolved to i mean i never i never felt any of them when they contacted me that i needed them for any particular thing i mean they just it like okay let's go let's go back now we had the tesseract let me finish the story of how i met dr simon and this is how people going to the inn this is what they're doing just like i'm not the only one that like has met dr simon uh you know they're meeting their counterparts also and then bringing it, uh, that information back so that they can they're channeling now and working with it just like i am with with dr simon that's a whole reason of of going uh is contact and and going to the inn at this battery time so when i said to when lily said to me uh you know which one do you you know vibrate with and i said the tesseract and so when i said the tesseract the tesseract picture a cube within a cube and it was alive vibrantly beautifully dancing energy and color and everything and it was probably about two feet by two feet uh it wasn't on the wall but it was by by the wall okay in the inn and so when I said the Tesseract, it came forward and then it became a dimensional doorway, like about seven feet, you know, in the inn, uh, seven feet tall. And so Lily said to me, if you uh, go through 
you know, the doorway, uh, you'll meet another of your counterpart selves. So when I went in to the Tesseract, then I saw this tall, about six foot two, brown hair. I didn't see his face, but I did see, um, you know, uh, how tall he was and he had brown hair. And he was wearing the, uh, the white, you know, coat of a, a doctor. And he was working on a 10-year-old boy and his energy field. OK, so and then I I could observe and I saw Dr. Si I didn't know his name was Dr. Simon at that moment, but I saw this doctor working on this 10 year old boy and I could see the energy field of the boy and how it, how some of it was sort of gray and I could see the colors and everything and how he was manipulating the energy and everything to bring it into an alignment. So I observed that. Then I came back out of the Tesseract and then it it went back to the two by two and, you know, up by the wall. And so I said to Lily, because I knew it was a future self, and uh, I said, uh, does he live around in 2050? And she said, no, 2065. I said, okay. And so we ended that visit. Well, the next day, uh, telepathically, Dr. Simon contacted me, and he told me what his name was, and he told me, uh, you know, uh, that he was an energy healing doctor. Uh, and then I had had sciatica uh, real bad for about a month. Uh, I was on taking pain pills. I, if you've ever had it, you know how painful it is. Um, and so I was doing everything. So when he came on, uh, he started working. Now, he works with um, energy tools. He calls them wands and probes. And... Uh, when I've talked to Bashar calls them waveguides. Okay. And so when uh, they are, these waveguides are probes as he calls them. Now the technology was first, his first probe was uh, and waveguide uh, and wands was given to him by Dr. Alicia. I meant, I mentioned her. She's from the uh, Yale civilization. So it's her technology uh, from the Yale uh Yale civilization that uh, those probes were from. And so he, he started working. He was working with me with these probes. And think of the probe as like I've got a, uh, it's a laser, okay? I've got my own handheld laser that I've had for years. And it has also has a probe that you plug into it. And it's about eight, eight uh, maybe eight inches long. And, uh, uh, you know, then it has the frequency sampling. So that's sort of what his probes look like. And so he uses the probes, but they are, uh, when he's working with it, like one has uh, uh, like a brush on it. <clears throat> and then in the middle is a laser and the laser uh, vibrates, penetrates, and it uh, goes down and works with like, say the pain, which uh, he was working with. And so he goes through and he always tells you what he's doing. Um, you know, the brush is rotating and the pulsating uh, laser and, uh, you know, because pain has its own vibrational frequency. OK. And so that was he doing. So he'd work with me not for more than about 15 minutes or so. And we do this. And so each time, well, I don't know how many times we did it, maybe four or five times or something like that. It just depends on, you know, what he's working on and how you are into healing. Uh, so then the pain got less until it went away and then I got it on the right side and so then we went through and we did that so he started working with me on some healthy I'm pretty healthy <clears throat> but those were and I had to have some healthy health issues uh with him to work on me because I've always been a person uh that just blew me away when uh I'm channeling a doctor not only from the future uh, an energy healing because I've never really been into the alternative methods. I'm sort of a person that's always, hey, go to a doctor, take a pill type of person. So it really surprised me when uh, when he, uh, you know, came into my life um, and started working with the probes and everything. So anyway, then he took that energy away. Uh, but at that period of time, uh, I had uh, been going to a doctor. 
uh, for my knee. I needed a knee operation on my right knee because uh, it was bone on bone. And I'd been getting um, cortisone shots for almost two years before I met him. So 2016, I'd go in every three months, get a cortisone shot. And eventually I would, I, at that period of time, I was getting ready. The doctor had said, well, you know, you're probably going to need the operation real soon here. So the other thing that he worked on was uh, when, if you've ever had cortisone shots <clears throat> after a while, <clears throat> It may be, you might get them every three months, but at the end of uh, two months or so, you start getting some of the pain before you can get the next shot. <clears throat> and so that's where I was sort of at, uh, at that period of time. And so he did a few sessions with that, uh, with my knee. And <clears throat> my knee is like good as good as new. I have not been back to a doctor. There's no need. It's like, I don't need an operation. So what's the name of the... Uh the um, cartilage so your cartilage was gone yeah it's it, it gets uh, like bone on bone yeah so your cartilage was gone and it was bone on bone so it, using the laser or these tools you he regrew your cartilage yes? i have no idea uh i just he just took the pain away and if you don't have the pain so i never went back to the doctor to have it x-rayed again i have no idea that i'm reading a book um it's called uh the emotion code uh-huh he mentions the the author uh dr bradley nelson mentions a fellow who um one of his associates said well put uh put magnets on your knee and he said this guy put magnets on his knee for 10 days and it re i guess it regrew his cartilage I, I can't imagine it doing anything else but uh that would have been the a solution or the solution and the, the, uh, as far as this you know similar to what you're talking about and i have um oddly enough i have the same problem as you do oh do you <laughs> yeah I, my left knee is uh it's I don't know if it's bone on bone, but the cartilage is pretty much gone, so it's close to it's close to bone on bone. It's very it's pretty much that or very close to that, and so it's uh, may not be quite as bad as you had, but it's pretty close. So that's where I'm at. And, uh, so, and are then, you using that method uh, that you're reading about? Well, I took a a, a knee brace. Or it's a cheap one. It's like three dollars. And uh, and I put I taped a bunch of magnets inside of it to be right over my knee. Mm -hmm. and I had it on my knee for 10 days and I it was really stupid what I did because you you really want to take if you were, let's say you were going to do the same thing I did, but in a, in a proper way. What you would do is you would take the magnets and tape them to your knee, right? And, and you wouldn't have any, you wouldn't have a brace or anything. It was just, you would just, you know, like just tape them straight to your knee and don't have anything else on there, because if you use a a, a knee brace, like I, well, not all of them are the same, but the ones when I had it actually constricts your knee and it cuts off the circulation in your leg. So mm -hmm. if you wear it for 10 days, at the end of 10 days, what happens is your, your whole leg swells up because it has no circulation. Mm. So that's what happened to me. I uh, At the end of 10 days, I had no I had very poor circulation in my leg and it, it was swollen. So that was like two days ago. It was the end of the 10 days. And the 29th, it started on, I put it on the 18th and I took it off on the 29th and so the swelling has gone down, and fortunately, my leg has recovered from my stupid act of, putting, <laughs> of keeping a uh, blood uh, constricting device on my leg for 10 days. That was the dumb part. The magnets wasn't bad, but the way 
how you do things is obviously very important. So. Yeah, very true. Well, uh, people have used, uh, there's magnetic, um, uh, you can buy the sleeves that you can put on any part of your body, you know, like the arm or leg and all that kind of stuff. And people, you know, there's many different modalities uh, that you can use. Um, I would have, so you, do you have a lot of pain? No, I have relatively no pain. Oh, I just, well. I, my deal is that, um, I go for really long walks with my wife. We used to go for nine and 10 mile walks and, and longer. And then we eventually got it down to six miles. So that's what we do about, about six miles now. And I, after what it, the way it was ending up was I would do a couple days with her of the six mile walks. And then, on the third day, I'd get like halfway through my walk by myself on a weekday because she, she walks in the morning and I walk, you know, after work and that sort of thing. We're not together. And so I'll get halfway through that that walk on the third day and it, I have to stop and, and, you know, be off of it for like the rest of the week. And I'm I'm used to never taking a break. And so, but it, you don't know half my story. So here's the, here's the rest of the story that I haven't told you. Uh, what happened was, uh, hold on a second. Let me, I've got to back up about six steps backwards to really help you understand what's going okay. on. Okay. Okay. So I have um, two attaching spirits attached to my body. They're, they're demonic in nature. And so I've had them, I smoked pot morning and night for 18 years. And so um, because of, um, because of their, these uh, attaching spirits, I uh, was riding my bicycle one day with my wife and I was, we were in Portland, Oregon, and I was in a really good mood and I was way ahead of her. And I had a, a Basically, the the attaching spirit that sits on my head fed to me a false reality that uh, I was actually getting near a bridge. I was crossing it. I was about to cross a bridge on my bicycle, and in my head, I was seeing a a a bridge that I was crossing. But the bridge that I was seeing in my head was was not the real one. It was a fake. It was just one that existed only in my head. It was fed to me by my that attaching spirit. And so when I got to a particular point, as I was getting onto the bridge, a real bridge uh, that really existed, I the one I was seeing in my mind was like an, a full inch or two inches, three inches above the surface of the road. And so I went to do kind of a wheelie to pick up the front of the bike to sit it on that surface above the road that didn't exist and uh, for a fake bridge that didn't exist. And so when I did that, I pulled up, I not, I used to do wheelies on a motorcycle for a long, you know, I was pretty good at it. I could never switch gears and keep it up, but if I, as long as I kept it in one gear, I could do a wheelie for a long time on a motorcycle, but I was never any good on a bicycle. So I figured when I jerked this bike upright uh, or the front of it up, that it would just go up an inch and 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 then come back down and I would hit the the edge of this bridge and bounce off. But uh, there just happened to be a spot where the front tire was, where a um, an earthquake had had risen that. Uh, part of the bridge up a uh, maybe uh, half an maybe an inch or less above the, the level I was on. So there was a little lip there, and so it wasn't what I was seeing in my mind, but it existed in the real world. And I pulled up, and instead of the bike just coming up an inch and going back down, it actually flipped all the way up, straight up. So I didn't expect it. So I wasn't moving forward. I was moving forward like walking speed. I was almost dead stop, but I didn't expect the bike to go upright, fully upright like that. I'd never 
been able to pull a bike up like that. But because the, the lip of the of the uh, road had uh, an upswing right at that moment where I did the, pulled it up, the bike flipped up. It was totally vertical. What I should have done was step off of the bike because I wasn't moving forward at all. I was pretty much stopped. I could have stepped off the bike and every, everything would have been fine, but it caught me off guard. And so I my let my feet were still on the, the pedals. My rear was still on the seat. I didn't step off, which I should have done. And I just held on and the bike fell to the right. And as it fell, um, there was a a one inch square wooden pole sticking out of the ground about head height and, and, and height. And I hit the side of that and it caught my um, my feet on the pedals where I, my, where I wouldn't fall off where the where the feet were like stuck to the pedals. Mm -hmm. My mm -hmm. upper body was still on the seat and or my low, my rear end was still in the seat and my upper body as the bike was falling to the right and then got hung on the pole the wooden pole my upper body kept kept going in that direction it uh basically my whole body fell off of the bike and hit the ground like you would take a ruler if you took a ruler and you hit it really hard on the surface i mean really hard mm -hmm. and still had it in your <clears> hand <throat> and still held the ruler in your hand it was sort of like that my body hit the the side of my hip, hit the concrete, while my feet were still stuck on the pegs of the bike. And so it broke my hip. And so um, I'm telling you all this because once I, they put uh, three or four pins, very long screws into my hip just to piece it together like two in the morning that, that next morning. And then I had those in for like a year and I had them removed. And when I had them removed, um, that's when we realized that the, um, the femoral head had died. And so um, basically my hip needed to be replaced. So I got a hip replacement. And mm. when they replaced the hip, <clears throat> the uh, length of the legs, uh, my right leg can be, I've looked at it on a given day, and it's exactly the same length as my left leg. On another day, it will be as much as an inch shorter. Mm. And it changes from day to day. And so there's a technology I was thinking of inventing that would make it so this, this what the guy did, the surgeon did, would never happen to another person. But basically, it, it's not a perfect cut. And so the links are not uh, the same. And when you have your leg length is different from one to the, to the other, that's where the cause of the, the uh, cartilage damage occurs because the, the, on, the, on the side that wasn't shortened, um, it's not centered properly and, and therefore it messes up, it, it basically uh, eats up your cartilage. And well, so, that's one way. But most well, that's, of it that's, is, is well, that's osteoarthritis is, is wear and tear on the body. Through What's the that? Years. Osteoarthritis uh, that, that we have in the knee uh, is from wear and tear normally on the body. Right, right. Yeah. Well, I've always been a, uh, I was a runner and then I started uh, power walking at some point because when I was running, at a certain age, I got to the point where I would have to take off one day a week. I could run, even old as an older person, I could still run every day. And then I, it ended up where I had to take off one day out of the week. And so I started, I didn't want to take off a day. So I switched from running to power walking. And so I've been doing that for a long time. And and I could just as well have bicycled. And it probably would have not all occurred the way it did because bicycling doesn't have the impact but um, in any case that's my where i'm at and why did i bring all that up oh because <laughs> it's, because it's the same as same condition as you have so yeah well i i've actually had a knee replacement on my left leg um 
but I the left leg. Well, like I said, uh, osteoarthritis can you know set in, and uh, that uh, it's the cartilage and this type of thing. But in this particular case, when uh, many, 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 many years ago, uh, when I was fairly young, quite young, uh, I had an auto accident um, that put me in the hospital for about five months, and I had to learn to walk all over again and everything. But what I was the basic point of that is that left leg had a double compound fracture <clears throat> on it and that too can can when once you've fractured uh, a part of your body that can also uh, osteoarthritis can uh, set in uh, you know years later that can help it along <clears throat> so and talking about uh, that um, uh, leg was maybe about a half an inch quarter of an inch or half an inch shorter <clears throat> at the time than my other leg um <clears throat> and then of course you walk a little differently but um when i <clears throat> i had uh i was on uh I, the shots okay i went to the i did shots for which many of us do before we want to have an operation because <clears throat> you really don't want to look forward to that uh i did the steroid uh shots for in my knee for about three years and then my doctor finally said, hey, it's time to get the operation. <clears throat> so I did. And I I just whistled through it. It was the best thing I ever did. <clears throat> and when um, uh, the doctor put uh, the knee and everything in, it uh, shored up my leg so that uh, I, I don't have that discrepancy uh, in the half inch anymore. Um, <clears throat> but then on the right knee, uh, in that accident, uh, I had smashed my knee cap. Uh, you don't really need a knee cap except for protection, and I've lived all these years without it. Um, so the osteoarthritis, but it took all these years uh, to get it in the right leg, and that's when I was going in for the shots in 2018 when I met Dr. Simon. But the thing is, the pain, I've always, uh, it's marvelous that you don't have the pain because the pain is why I had to get the cortisone shots because uh, it was excruciating pain. So <clears throat> Dr. Simon, uh, I don't have the pain. Um, and whether I have cartilage there or not, to me, makes no difference because uh, the only thing I was going for is is to be free of pain. <clears throat> so... Do you do any form of exercise now? I just do a uh, walking. Um, I don't like to walk outside or anything, but I have a uh, <clears throat> I have a DVD with a walking and exercising. Uh, I do that two three times a week. So you do in place walking? Yeah, in place walking, and I also dance a lot. So. So do you have a treadmill or do you just? No, no, just do. That's the only thing I do. Okay. And dance a lot. I love dancing. Well, my mother was into um, uh, what's the what's the exercise that's a dance that everybody does? It's very popular. I don't know if there's, there's a, a particular. I mean, dancing to me in general is good exercise. Well, there's a there's a particular dance exercise that it's 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 sort of <laughs> it's a dance, but it's also an exercise. Okay. So it, you know, it's like. Kind of like things that, um, oh, what's her face? The actress, uh, I can't remember her name. Jane. Used, Jane Fonda, yeah. Yeah. It's sort of like the stuff that she did, but it's not. Right. It's not any of that. It's it's an actual dance, but it's it's a dance that's used. I don't know if it's only used in exercise, but I think it is only used in as an exercise. But there's a name for it. It's very popular. And uh, but you might want to look it up. It's because it's what you like. It's dance and it's an exercise. And they, a lot of people do it. I, I was in a gym one time, and uh, I walked in this. My wife and I walked. Or I don't know if she was with me at the moment. I was there, but I walked into this one room where there, there was a lot of noise, uh, uh, music coming from this one room. It was like unbelievably loud in the next room. And I walked in that room just to see what was going on. And they were doing this this dance that my mother used to do, dance exercise. And, man, that music was loud. I don't know how they were 
even uh, standing it, but uh, they were having fun. They looked like they were having fun. So. Right. <clears throat> well, so anyway, um, Dr. Simon worked with me on uh, a few things and before for about six months uh, before uh, he ever uh, channeled for anybody else. But then he started channeling with other people with many, many, many different diseases. And he uses, then he also got, um, <clears throat> he was using the uh, probe and waves from Dr. Alicio from the Yale Civilization. And then after, <clears throat> I met Zytec about a year and a half ago. And uh, Dr. Simon uh, got a um, other probes and waves from uh, the from Zytec from his civilization, and uh, they are uh, actually um, well. They they work with um, what it does is it they're quantum light wave frequency probes, is what he calls them, and uh, it works. It automatically adjusts. Everything is cycles per second. Uh, you know, our body, the different diseases and that we have um, many, many years ago, but back in the 1930s, um, it was discovered uh, that you're probably familiar with that, that each part of the uh, disease, each disease has its own vibrational frequency. Have you heard that before? Uh, well, I mean, I, as a hypnotherapist, I was trained to, to um talk to the cells of the body to release their memory and um so i have heard the the book i'm reading now is, gets into uh, uh emotional uh, what do you call the, the emotional uh i don't know what you call them the 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 when you get an emotion stuck in your body that energy as a, is obviously going to have a vibration. I think everything within the this plane of existence obviously ha, it has a vibration. So sure, I, I understand. Well, we're made saying. of energy. Yeah, totally made of energy, and we vibrate uh, at so many cycles per second. Uh, right. And this probe, what it does as it's going, it adjusts if he's working uh, with the liver or he's. Uh, you know, working with uh, the heart or whatever part of the body, the issue that he's working with, this probe automatically adjusts uh, and is sending the vibrational frequencies uh, for that particular part of the body, is what I'm saying. And so you were saying Dr. Simon had waveguides from... The Yael, then he got more waveguides from the Coco. Uh, yeah, he calls them probes and wands. Bashar is the one that calls them waveguides. Yeah, so, probes and wands. First ones were from Dr. Alicio from the Yael civilization. And and so he worked with those for, uh, well, all the way up until about a year and a half ago. And, uh, I mean, he still uses some of those. But uh, the the uh, quantum light wave frequency probes given to him by Zytec, uh is mostly what he uses today. So do you know the difference between the ones he got from the IELTS? No, they all work with vibrational frequency. I mean, it, they, they work with the body, uh, you know, just energy. I think they're very similar. So when the very first time you ever saw the, uh, the uh, Tesseract, do you remember that experience? When I first saw the Tesseract? You mean in my dream? Or? Well, um, okay, so you saw it in oh, your dream. Oh, when I when I experienced when I experienced it when I saw it at the inn. Well, that's when I first really saw it. I guess, yeah, that would be it. Because yeah. it was alive. I mean, en everything is energy, and it was alive and vibrating, and and uh, just all these different colors and the energy and everything from it was is spectacular. Uh, can you go through that? experience i mean have you already mentioned it or is that yeah i went through it i told you that uh when so the, that was your first one yeah with the tesseract that was the the first symbol when that came down and then i went through the doorway and that's when i met dr simon so i wonder if the the marvel 
um, that uh, set of the, the cinematic universe or the the uh, the the comics that predate the cinematic universe. I wonder how much of that comes from the real world. You know, you wonder uh, because the Tesseract, if if it was in the comics and in the cinematic universe, but yet it exists in the real world, then then somebody got it from the real world and put it in the fictional world. So I'm curious. I'd be curious about that. That's. I think we all. I think all of our sci-fi and and everything has come from uh, uh, our <clears throat> movie making. <clears throat> uh, filmmakers and everything like that i think that they're all they're all having uh experiences and and interacting now whether they're physic you know uh tele uh energetically acting with them like i do when i go to the inn <clears throat> is something but you remember i told you that you're really in contact um most people don't know it but you're really in contact. It's a two-way street between your counterpart selves or let's say your future selves. They're, it, it's all informational. That's what it's about. They're sending you information. You're getting the information. So I think they've probably tapped in like I have, uh, although I didn't do mine on purpose. It was brought to me. But I think they they are probably, I can imagine them tapping in to their counterpart selves getting all of this information. And hey, in 2070, you know, we <clears throat> the... Uh, uh, the civilizations have landed on Earth and, and they've got these probes and waves, the, uh, you know, technology uh, that, uh, you know, is going on. So I think all of the uh, Star Trek movies and everything is, uh, you know, based on a lot well, of imagination, I, but imagination is real and, and probably getting information from their uh, future selves. I know that uh, the guy who... Um, who came up with Star Trek? I can't remember. Uh, can't remember his name off the top of my head. I should be able to, but I don't right at this moment. Is that Gene Roddenberry? Isn't Gene it? Gene Roddenberry. Yeah, he went to <clears throat> he he visited UFO type meetings like MUFON mm -hmm. before MUFON existed. Uh, he had visited these meetings, and they at these meetings they were there was a fellow channeling. Uh, who channeled a couple, two or three books, and uh, I assume he got his information from that fellow and probably other people that channeled at these meetings. And I also heard a rumor that uh, Gene Roddenberry channeled himself. And so, you know, I don't know how much of this is true and how much is fiction or or not, but uh, it seems like that it that's a good chance that that was the case. Yeah, we're always, everybody's always channeling. You're channeling all the time. Um, just most people aren't aware of it. That's all. Well, so of all these characters, beings that you, that you uh, come through you, that help your clients, you, what, did you have a life before healing people? What did you do before you did, what got into healing? Oh my God, so many things. <laughs> Just different things to survive, right? Oh, I started <clears throat> I started out working when I was uh, 14 years old <clears throat> at as a cashier um, at a theater. Um, what did you do? Because after I wanted to work, and <clears throat> then I went on and uh, after school, uh, I worked. Uh, my first job was with uh, Remington Rand Univ. I lived in Minnesota. Remington Rand Univac and worked in the uh, patent department and did that. Oh, Univac is in the computer. Yeah, the big Remington Rand Univac computers at that time. Remember, computers <clears throat> back then. This is in the seventies. They were like um, rooms. They were huge. Yes, I remember. And the discs were were huge. I mean, the reels, they were reels. I mean, it, it was very interesting. But uh, I went on, you know, on from there, mostly uh, sales, uh, sales and advertising and that through the years. Uh, I was a headhunter for about five years. I placed uh, um, engineers and programmers into their 
their jobs. Um, I worked in closed circuit TV uh, at the time when um, uh, women were, I had six salespeople that were all male and uh, <clears throat> went out and uh, sold. We sold, um, well, now they, at the time, the tape decks were huge. I mean, you know, our little records that we have today, but everything was huge, just like, uh, you know, our our computers and everything at the time. Sure, sure. <clears throat> and so we sold the units, uh, cameras and uh, the packages to uh, businesses like, um, I think, one of the telephone companies, uh, Pac Bell, I think at the time was one of my clients and <clears throat> large clients, and they would take it and use it for training people. For, for, for training their people, internal people and uh, banks. And uh, I was got into the military um, selling them. Um, we, in fact, we had a, I was responsible for bringing in a very large contract with the uh, Air Force. And the Air Force, um, we won the bid, our, my company won the bid. It was my contact uh, from... Uh, uh, well, with Norton Air Force Base, which I don't even think is in operation today, but Nort Norton Air Force Base at, base at the time, and they wanted a and color. The color it was it used to be all black and white, and color was just you know all of that has was a, a big thing at the time, and they delivered a tractor trailer, and they had us build a color studio into it, and uh, but then it was. They actually did it out of California, but it was for Carswell Air Force Base in Texas that it went to. But that was a very, at the time, I think it was like almost $400,000 uh, contract was, you know, huge at the time when you consider, uh, you know, in today's money. Sure. Uh, so I was responsible for that. I went down to San Diego and I set up an office down there for them. I did that, like I said, a hand hunter. Oh my God! Uh, I used to sell real estate, um, business. Uh, I sold businesses, small businesses. Um, I would change. Uh, I like to do a lot of different things, and I've always been good at what I do. Uh, and I would change. I didn't just change jobs. I usually I would change careers. I also sold uh, for about three years uh, insurance, um, uh, medical insurance, but that was just specifically for businesses. I always worked with businesses, not, you know, personal people selling insurance or anything. So and, uh, yeah. When, when you, uh, the very first time you ever channeled, do you remember the very first experience? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I, um, now this was my second husband. He was not into all of this stuff. Okay. But, uh, I had, for some reason, at Christmas time, <laughs> I don't know why, but I bought him a Ouija board, uh, which was dumb because, like I said, but we hadn't been married uh, very long at the time. So anyway, I bought a Ouija board. It was just Christmas time, and uh, we never opened it up or you know did anything until I think it, it was February, uh, and we were going on a uh, ski trip uh, in um, Badger Pass in California and Badger, they told us, uh, we had a condo for, uh, you know, four day, four nights and uh, for the weekend, actually it was over the, um, um, Valentine's day weekend. And <clears throat> so they told us that there was no TV reception. So bring, uh, after, you know, you go skiing and everything, make sure you bring, uh, games with you and that type of thing. So I brought a lot of games, but I also brought the Ouija board and, I also, uh, my son and his girlfriend had joined us. So the four of us, uh, you know, and so the first night uh, after skiing and we all settled down, I brought out the Ouija board and his, uh, my son's girlfriend uh, was really into it. And so she and I put our, you know, just two fingers on the pochette, you know, uh, have you ever tried a Ouija board? Um, no, my wife yeah. has though. Oh, okay. And so when it starts moving, I mean, I've, I've always been into all of this. I told you I was out of body when I was six years old and talking to the angel and it was, it was a spacecraft. 
<clears throat> at the time. So all of my life, uh, you know, intuitively without even my knowing it. I mean, I, I've been brought into it since I was six years old. Uh, so I always believed in it, but I'd never tried it before. But when it starts moving and you know you're not moving it, it is really uh, quite a kick. So we were enjoying So we talked, uh, you know, the Ouija board moves so slow, you know, one letter at a time. Uh, but it was Zach was the, uh, and he's my first uh, contact, was Zach. And he's the only one uh, in a counterpart self, the only one presented himself as a uh, past life self, uh, which I already know that, like I said, there's no past or future, but uh, he lived, uh, he was in 18, from 1865. Uh, so he was the one that was, uh, he said it was the name of Zach. And uh, so we went on the Ouija board for maybe about 45 minutes. And I, and then we went on to other board games and we never did anything the rest of that weekend. But when we got home and I was working at the time in sales and everything. So at night and I'm a night owl. Uh, so uh, my husband would be, you know, in bed and I'd be there talking to Zach on the Ouija board. And uh, so this went on for about three, four months. And, uh, you know, I'd write everything down and, uh, so then, uh, are you into, uh, you heard of Jane Roberts, Seth, yes, channeled by I've Jane heard, Roberts. Heard of. Yeah. yeah. So many of us cut our teeth on uh, Jane. I mean, she was our only inspiration and in everything about channeling, you know, uh, when she was doing it back in the late 60s and her first book, uh, I believe, in 1970. Um, so I was reading all the Seth books and I had all the Seth books. So this particular time was about three, four months later, I think. Uh, when I had been writing every night, just about every night with Zach on the Ouija board. And I was, um, I opened up her book and she had said, I don't do it, but uh, many of my, you know, the people do automatic writing. And she said, you know, just take a piece of paper and a pen and uh, do automatic. I thought, oh, God, what? That's fabulous. Automatic writing. Yay. So I took a, a yellow pad of paper and, uh, <clears throat> and my, uh, uh, and a pen. And then uh, that's when I then started writing with Zach in automatic writing. It was so much simpler and so much faster than, uh, you know, I would never went back to the Ouija board. I still have that Ouija board in my closet today, but I never went back to the Ouija board, of course, after that. And I did automatic writing. And then when I was doing automatic writing, I would always hear Zach uh, maybe two, three, maybe two, three, four words ahead of time of what I was writing in my head which is telepathic communication. Didn't know it at the time, <clears throat> but I would hear it. And then when I put the, you know, put the pen down and was finished, then that was it. And then I think it was, I don't know how long after that, put two and two together, or I don't know if Zach said something to me or whatever, but I realized that, hey, when I put the pen down, I don't have to stop hearing him in my head. And then from that is what born telepathic communication for me. I think you're very lucky to have pulled through a, a positive spirit because I think it, it could have just as easily been the other way around. No, I don't believe in that. You see, my belief, and of course, from working with Bashar all these years, too, <clears throat> and his consensus with it, is that uh, you cannot, you you cannot, uh, nobody, no spirit or anybody that's why i've never ever been uh concerned with my channeling because they you're invisible to anybody now this is my belief come from uh what i've heard from bashar and what i've not just because bashar said it but from what i've come to believe also is that uh they can't really see you because uh they're not the vibration of what you're channeling so if uh so it, it's not my belief so uh, I know that my beliefs create my reality, and so that that's not a, a factor for me. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I don't know where we're gonna go with this. So we're at an hour and thirty nine minutes, and ah, it seems okay. like we've covered everything. All is right. There, is your is your um, is there any parts of your stories that you want to go through that you haven't uh, yet gone through that that uh, you feel would be important for people? Well, to yeah, I want uh, people to know uh, with Lily Stargazer that that you could go to the inn and you can meet 
you know, your counterpart selves or uh, you can meet the beings. Because a lot, a lot of people uh, on the planet, of course, you know, I'm really into the Bashar group. Do you know that there's something like 52,000 people in the Bashar channeling group? So he has a very huge uh, following, which I'm part of that group. I I still listen to his um, uh, his channelings, you know, once a month and the whole thing. But because um, I think, uh, you know, it's the greatest information as far as I'm concerned that we have. Um, so want people to know that you can now is the time and and people are experiencing uh their their like new channels are coming up uh, new people are that are channeling are coming up all the time okay and so like patrick uh one of the the clients went to the inn and he he had been channeling uh, uh a hybrid okay he had met a hybrid in that and she actually told him now, Patrick had, had had gone to the inn several times uh, uh, in 2019, so he's gone uh, to the inn probably two, three times. But this particular time, and this was just a few months ago, uh, this um, the hybrid uh, told him to get a meeting with Lily so that he could go to the inn, and she introduced him uh, when he went to the inn, and he's very visual, and and we you know i take i have the transcripts and and the audios and everything but i've published the transcripts uh uh online uh you know within the channeling group and and uh some of the other sites and that that are all into this and he met i think seven uh she introduced him to seven or eight of his other um i don't know that they were all counterparts but beings that he's that uh he will be working with and so he when you take that back just like with dr simon OK, uh, you take that back and then you start. Uh, that's your connection uh, to your future selves. And, uh, you know, people have have uh, are going to the inn, and that that's the purpose of it is to go and, and meet. If that's of interest to you, uh, that's where you are in your life and you really want to. And it doesn't have to be just for, you know, because you want to channel somebody. You can go to the inn. People have met uh, um um, Bigfoot, uh, you know, Sasquatch at the bar. You think the bar, uh, the tavern, the, I always say that, you, you know, you think of uh, Star Wars, you know, the bar in Star Wars, where all, right. all the congregations of the civilizations. Well, <clears throat> Lily's Tavern is like that. It's a hub for all these different species, okay? But it, it's a, a, a much more sophisticated version than that, than that, uh, uh, bar was and so she she's the the hub you know come and 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 talk and and she brings in the people or the in beings and that that you uh you know need to meet we had one uh we've only done one and i i look forward to maybe doing more but we had one group of four and they were very four visual visual people and um they they had their own experience. Each one had their own experience in their own bubble reality at the end. Okay. Which everybody got to observe. And then, uh, like Aaron was the first one that went, uh, Aaron Elliott and she's in the shark group. And then she said, Hey, can I bring other people into my room? And so then all the, the other three went into her room and then they were, uh, at the end, they were doing a, a Congo dance, going out to the terrace, and then they're out there and they're meeting more beings. And uh, it's just, a, a, you know, a fun, fun place. And in her meeting, she saw a white, uh, look like a white dog or wolf. And then she, in her experience, she uh, then did a shape shift and down and she was sitting on this white wolf, that was her experience. I mean, they all had their own personal experience, but then they had their 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 experiences, you know, together. Then they all ate at the end, the whole thing. The other thing I wanted to say that before uh, people, before I started going to the inn, when I first met Lily, she was actually working with clients uh, from June of 2016 to July of 2019. And she was assisting them in breaking free from uh, their self-limiting core beliefs, okay? And so 
they would uh, she'd have sessions with people helping them to empower their lives, change their beliefs, because when you change your belief, you change your reality. OK, you, ex- you change your experiences. So for three years, she did that. And then when found out that she owned the Stargazer Inn uh, in 2019 in August, then that's when I started uh, taking people to the inn, having my own experiences with the inn. Uh, I mean, it's fun. It's uh, enjoyable. And you can have it just a, a fun thing to do or also, uh, you know, it brings back so that you meet you meet these people, uh, you know, these beings, these future selves that really come back and help you in your life. So when you take people to the end um, or when or even when you were taken to the end. How does that work is you do you put. Do you help people go into a deep trance to go no, there? Or how does no, it work? No, they just like with me, you're you're either lying down or I like I sit on my recliner at home and you energetically uh, you can remember I told you I give you a very, very detailed description of what the end looks like. So uh, and then Lily will be there for waiting for you. And now some people uh, are more visual than other people. Um but most of the people going there uh, do uh, she when you first come, she always gets you a, a drink uh, that you like. OK, and that that helps you relax and it helps you be able to open up the third eye to be able to see more clearly. Like I told you, I see by feeling. I don't know if that you can understand that, but I'm not a, a very visual because I don't see any. Uh, of the people I channel. Other, I mean, I saw Dr. Simon, but when I'm channeling in that, I'm not, I'm not there, not seeing it. Uh, it's all, you know, channeling it for, for my clients and they're talking. Um, but she, uh, I give you that description. So, like I said, you, you are there energetically, and actually, an energetic, how you show up at the end as is as a hologram. That's what an energetic, uh, you show up as yourself uh, energetically like a hologram. And that's who you're interacting with everybody as a hologram. And then you, um, you know, she brings in uh, usually like one at a time and they sit down. She has a very big uh, booth and it grows. And, you know, if you have four or five people, the booth automatically grows uh, to accommodate everybody. And you, what you do is you're, you're like, say, uh, you want to ask, a, let's say Dr. Simon is there and I wanted to ask him a question. I am speaking, uh, out loud to Dr. Simon. And if I say, okay, uh, what, uh, tell me about, uh, you know, what your office looks like in Colorado, but, you know, and, and I'm saying it out loud because we need it on the recording. Okay. And his answers are coming back telepathically to me, all right? And then I am, I, or the person that is there, okay, uh, is repeating uh, then what, uh, what he had to say. And so it's, it's, you get a two-way conversation, but it's through the telepathic, which also teaches you uh, how to receive telepathically, which is very good for in your own timeline. So your clients, you work in, in person or over Skype or both? No, all no, all uh, most of my most of my uh, clients are actually international, um, and it's all done by phone. Oh, so, so use your imagination. You you uh, project yourself energetically there, and uh, and then you see in her timeline, just like she taught me to see in her timeline, and and you will see in her timeline, and you will see the people. Uh, that you're meeting, the beings that you're meeting. Have you ever had a client where it didn't work? I had just one client that um, she was uh, she was very, very nervous and uh, about being able to see and everything. And as it turned out, uh, Lily, of course, knows all of this. And so she sensed it, that she really needed to talk about what was going on in her life her belief systems and that as to what's going on. So actually Lily switched uh, to her 
uh, with her and then just sat there and uh, did a session uh, about her beliefs and everything because that's exactly what she needed at the time. But otherwise, most people know they uh, it might take a little longer for some people. Uh, she sits with you, talks with you. Uh, you sip on your drink and and she'll say, OK, tell me what you see. Uh, you know, and it'll bring it in. But most people know they can see some people really, really, uh, you know, like my four people in the group. I mean, they were uh, astonishing. Uh, and then Patrick and Tom and a lot of the others. No, they, they can see pretty good. So. You um, call your client or a client calls you. I call them. You call your client. A specific and, time. And yeah. you start tell them to close close their eyes and no beforehand uh i have already sent as soon as they sign uh, you know uh, sign up to be a client uh they want to go for a visit to the inn uh i present them like i told you with the description but within the description i also uh tell them how to prepare if they if they are into meditating and they want to meditate ahead of time whatever works for them OK, uh, and to use their imagination and to, uh, you know, so I, I give them that. So when when they answer the phone, actually, Lily is on the phone. I'm not there. Lily is on the phone. And just like with Dr. Simon or Dr. Michaels, they're immediately on the phone with them. And then the session starts and then she uh, tells them, let me know. So they are already prepared uh, to go, you know, to go to the inn energetically. and. So then she'll say, OK, let me know when you feel you're here. And uh, and usually that only takes a few minutes. I I haven't really had anybody uh, like I said, sometimes it might take longer to for some people. But it, uh, eventually uh, and usually when I say take longer, it's not you know all that long to uh, start acclimating and being able to uh, to see fairly decent, you know, pretty good in the end. Especially with the description, like I said, if I read a book and I had the I read a book and uh, reading a book and I have the description of the inn, uh, even though I'm not don't consider myself a real visual person, I can know exactly what that looks like. So how, uh, ballpark, how many clients have you taken to the inn so far? Oh, God, I don't know. Hundreds. Hundreds? Yeah. So you, how long have you been taking people to the inn? Three years. So you do this. Almost every day, or how how often do you have? Uh, it depends. It uh, it uh, goes in streaks. Because um, remember, I'm also in. I'm also doing. I don't do as many of the um, Dr. Michaels with the animals. Uh, that clientele isn't really huge. Uh, I haven't not really, you know, published or um, put time into that. Uh, a lot of them uh, have been uh, Dr. Simon, between Dr. Simon and, and Lily. So you do both? Yeah. Oh, yeah. I do all three. All three. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. I have one woman with um, Dr. Michaels who has been uh, bringing, she has an energy balance, just an energy balancing system uh, session uh, every two weeks for her two dogs, Minnie and Monty. And they're like 18 years. It started out. She'd been doing it for three years now. Started out when they were 15. They're 18, I believe now. And uh, <clears throat> she has the energy balancing session just to keep them um, alive and and in in good health. Or not in good health because they they have health problems. Uh, but it's to sustain them to be able to, you know, continue to live. So what what kind of dogs are they? Uh, her dogs are little uh, miniature poodles, and she also had a cockatiel when we started out, Lou, and then Lou died uh, about a year or so ago, but we still have Monty and uh, Minnie and Monty. And then I had another woman in, um, no, uh, she's from Australia. Like I said, most of my people are, are international. I had another woman with her cat uh, from uh, Russia, and uh she did a four week uh, session. Her cat had cancer of the third eyelid. Now, <clears throat> she wasn't getting a session for that because she was getting chemotherapy uh, with her doctors uh, for that. But she would have us every time the cat had to have <clears throat> the chemo, then it'd be really wiped out and everything. So then we'd have a session with um, Dr. Michaels. 
and uh, you know to bring it around, uh, and so then she you know feel better afterwards because the chemo you know knocks them out just like it does uh, humans. So, but this particular cat also uh, had, um, and we did energy balancing sessions, and the cat also had um, for five years had um, a kidney. Uh, she was in four stage kidney failure. <clears throat> now we're just doing the energy in the energy balancing. It goes through the whole body and balances uh, the energy and and you know works on it. But after the first session, her the creatinine test, which tells you uh, how the kidneys are doing, was a little better. And after the second session, uh, blew her doctors away because uh, it was in remission. Uh, for the the creatinine test where it went back to normal, which uh, uh, is the indication of not having kidney disease. So there's, um, it it just very, uh, it it really is so uh, warming for me, so helpful for me to be able to help people with all of the different, um, you know, the situations. I I like to do a lot of energy balancing sessions with uh, Dr. Simon. So uh, Zach was first. Zach was first. Um, eventually, you got to. Let's see. I don't have the timeline of who was first. And it was. I know Zach was first because you. We've already gone. Well, on. yeah, he was the first one. But for the ones I channel, first it was Lily. I met her in so. 2013. I didn't start channeling her for others until 2016, and then uh, Dr. Simon. Uh, I met him. Uh, in June of 2018, and then I met uh, Dr. Michaels in uh, June of 2020. When I these are ones I, I started channeling for others at that time. So did you work with animals before you met? Uh, no, I'm Mike? not a no, I'm not into. I mean, I don't I don't have any animals of my own. I once had a cat that was with me for um, for 18 years, and he and he, the cat and I were very telepathic. Uh, But I haven't had any animals since then. Well, um, we're getting close to the two-hour mark. Yeah. I think we've gone over everything. Everything, yep, absolutely. Is there any any story you'd like to recall that you think people would want to hear or information you want to impart before we finish? You know, just I think I mean I have a lot, a lot of stories about going to the inn uh, that I published all the time. You're welcome to go through any number of stories that you know that you feel like relating. I'm I'm sure that the listener would like to hear anything that you want to impart. Uh, well, let me see. I had. Um, a recent one. Now, this is my visit to the end. Do you want to hear somebody else's visit to the end? I, I'm i okay either way. Whatever you... I, I, I would say both. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, I'll tell you uh, about uh, Patrick Godin's trip to the end. Now, these people have all... Um, that I'm telling you about have submitted uh, testimonials and, and uh, their trip to the end. OK, and he was the one I was telling you about. Uh, he had Raven, who's a hybrid girl uh, that he had been introduced to. And she's the one Raven. Now, this is the first time that has happened, that we've had actually uh, a hybrid uh, that suggested to Patrick. He had just been he wasn't channeling her for anybody else or anything at, uh, at the time. But I mean, he had just been introduced to her probably months, a few months or so. And he had his experience with her. But she's the one that suggested uh, that he meet her uh, to get a to get a an appointment to meet her at the uh, tavern at the inn. OK. And so we set up the, the meeting and and he goes through and he goes through the double doors at the inn and and uh, I, I'm sort of going off of I'm looking at right now his testimonial because I don't have it down, you know, in sure. my memory. I have mine sure. in my memory, but I don't have others. That's fine. Uh, so anyway, she, he came in and uh, 
uh, Lily was at the at her table at the end, and so was Raven. All right, and so he joined them. And then when he says when he sat down, now Raven, uh, he said was able to completely see. Uh, he was able to see her with her long brown curly hair, and she had one eye that is is uh, black and one eye that is yellow. Raven does. And <clears throat> so they sit down. Lily offers him a drink. Uh, this is the story, and he chose a root beer. Okay, and uh, he was saying that uh, uh, that he this is his story that he's telling. He said. Uh, Raven started to tell him, uh, tell why his meeting was important and how 2023 is a new beginning point for him to make his personal choices and not allow others to ch choose for him. He said, um, she will help me. This is what, how Raven, she will help me to be more in tune with the reality that I prefer. She will in many ways be more present through dreams. Most of the time uh, in the year to come will be through tele uh, telepathy and by channeling her more. Um, he was just doing it very, very little. When he received the root beer, he said it was delicious. Delicious. Raven extended her left arm and they touched fingertips. He said it was a happy moment. Then she said, I'm now inviting more beings to join us. Three not very tall grays were in the first group. And Raven said it was important for me to connect with them. I'm reading his story. Connect with them at this time. That group of three was involved during my younger time to make sure all was good. I asked Raven why the night before the session, I perceived a fetus in my inner vision. She said the grays were involved in the fetus vision to make sure that I will be able to expand in consciousness in this lifetime with a different in a, and a different space time. It was sim similar for Raven. He said from the ages of five to nine, he had many dreams with the grays. At first, he said it was scary, but with time, it became more friendly. Often, I was in a room with many children in a, uh, in a mothership. It's okay now, but I had to learn to adjust to their higher vibrational frequency. Finally, the grays were a positive guide for me to make sure that I one day will be ready for contact of my own free choice, because he was abducted. After pausing, Raven said that she and Lily have known each other for a while, and there is no accident why this meeting is happening. Now, the second group uh, that is coming in now that Raven brought in, a bubble a bubble of light shows up on the right-hand side of the tavern. Through this bubble, this, these are his words, I see two very tall beings with large yellow eyes and blue skin and no hair. They are from the Arturian consciousness and are floating in the air as they move towards us. They joined us at the table, and the table adjusted by itself. It grew larger. They said, Name us the twins. Then the Arturian said that they will support the idea of an energy form to make the connection with Raven easier for him. They took that form to make, make sense to me that I am connecting with a higher level, but they don't exist in that form. They can take as many different forms as they want. They are pure energy. They are with me forever to help me to understand true compassion. They also said that the dolphins I have connection with are also connecting with the Ar Arturian consciousness. Then we shift to, to the third being. A Pleiadian came to, to let me know that he will be more involved with channeling in the future, and Raven is opening the door to help me tune in to him. The Pleiadian name I received in the session was Marcus. I see him in a blue suit around six or seven feet tall. Marcus said I am also involved with the Pleiadian agenda. He repeated, remember, it's all in the now. Go with the flow of nature and reality. He also said that they will help my wife in a dream state to adjust to their energy. He encouraged me to understand that these greys, again, are a different faction of the ETs, as they are not all involved with the idea of abduction. Everyone plays their own role. Marcus told me, when I go outside to watch for a specific cloud that will start to move and change in size, size. That will help me connect more telepathically with him. He then had a young Pleiadian boy named Cactus join us. He had large blue eyes, and I was told that from time to time he will connect with me. He was an adult. He was with an adult woman who seemed to be his mother. Cactus is connected with a group of nine children from the Pleiades. Now, before the last part of the session was going to end, Lily said to look around the room and tell her what else I see. 
I saw a large tree in the corner of the tavern, and every branch had a unique little mirror on it. When I looked in one of the mirrors, I saw myself at different times in my life, one around six years old. The other was, was later when I was running with a soccer ball, all different reflections of my life. That was very cool. Then it was time to end this beautiful session. I just walked outside the tavern and came back into my now moment. That was his experience. And since coming back from that, uh, he has had, uh, he has actually, except especially when Marcus, the one that told him to go outside and look at the cloud, he's experienced that. He is uh, uh, channeling Raven. I think soon he will start channeling Raven for other people. Uh, so this is this is just only one idea, one uh, faction of going, you know, going to the inn and the experience that people have. What was it? You gave his full name. What was his name? His name is Patrick Godin, G-O-D-I-N. He's so from he's, Canada. So he's public with all of his experiences. Well, no, he was public with this one because he he wrote wrote this up and and. Uh, uh, about his visit to the inn, I asked him if he wanted to share that, and then I I did post that uh, in the Bashar group and in some of the other uh, groups, uh, you know, with with this uh, kind of interest in this kind of channeling. So he was in in that. He's not public uh, yet with his channeling. Like I said, with Raven, he's going to um, start uh, doing that. I think. Uh, in the very near future for uh, channeling for other people. So give us your experience then. Well, the your first one. Oh, I don't remember when I was first learning how to uh, into the inn. The very first time you experienced the inn yourself. What were... uh, that one, uh, that was just looking around um, and getting used to it. I, uh, uh, in my memory, because uh, these are the later ones that I'm telling you about uh, that are more pronounced and have more meaning. But uh, I met a uh, hybrid. Um, I met some hybrids. Uh, I was talking to them. They they weren't connected to me at all. Uh, but I was asking them about their life and, and this kind of stuff. That was my my first. Um, you know, my my first getting used to it. There wasn't uh, anything outstanding. Well, uh, you you act like it was no big deal, but to the rest of us, it, it <laughs> might be a big deal. It might be a very big deal to the rest of us. Uh, yeah, it, it just uh, well because the the others have been uh, you know so much uh, so much more. Um, well, give, us one, give us the one that stands let, out in your mind as being uh, okay. More, let me more than the rest. Well, let me share with you one that I did in April. Okay. I, I, I've gotten this written, so I'm, I'm going to read it. Okay. Oh, that's fine. All right. I said, on my recent visit to the tavern at the inn, I met with Lily. And a now, let me tell you that Lily, and, and don't ask me to explain this any further, that, but Lily is a, uh, what's called a rare... She is a rare mirror room shapeshifter, and she has created multiple versions of herself from different parallel realities to be every one, everywhere at once. And these are called stargazers, and they are the ones that run the inn. They're the barkeeps and the servers of the foods and the drinks and everything. Okay. Right. okay. And these stargazers, just like with Lily, the stargazers can change their size, the shape, or nature to accommodate whomever they're serving. Um, the bar at the end is like 16 and 16 feet long and, and it curves uh, as 16 feet. And then it, it, it curves uh, to the right has a curve on it. And, and um, then the, the chairs, I think are really interesting because the, the chairs uh, when any being sits down to with the chair, they're intuitive and they adjust to the size of the person, because you know some of the beings are really, really huge, tall and wide, and the whole thing. So they adjust to the size. Well, the stargazer, let's say the barkeep. Now, let's say that that she is um, talking with uh, an eight-foot uh, being at the bar. Okay, she can change her size 
to be the eight feet to communicate with them. So, but these are all multiple versions uh, of Lily being the kind of, uh, Lily, uh, Willa had said that she's a rear mirror room shapeshifter when I just uh, first found out about that. And because uh, I asked her, I said, how many people, you know, how many beings can do that? And she said, it's very rare. There's only a few uh, that she can create that. So um, anyway, in the, so when I say that I met with Lily and a stargazer, the stargazers, the ones that I just told you about, named Kayla. Lily asked Kayla to start teaching me to see visually, uh, and this will show visually in pictures in addition to seeing by feeling. Uh, now, I'm capable of seeing in their higher frequency reality this way, but I said I've always wanted to see by what I call pictures, as if seeing it on TV and a TV screen. So we're now sitting in the booth with Lily in the middle and Kayla and I across from each other so I could feel the energy should be sending more strongly. Lily had downsized the large booth to a much smaller one instantaneously because she has the telekinesis ability to manipulate matter to change its size. Telekinesis is just one ability within the power to manipulate everything called omnikinesis that she has. As Kayla began, now she's the stargazer, she said to close my eyes and as she started sending waves of energy that I was to inhale and feel, feel coursing throughout my body, my, my system. She pointed out that I was misguided in my definition of seeing in pictures. She said, you don't describe your own timeline this way, she said, so there's no need to compare these two ways of seeing as each are equally valid. Kayla pointed out that when I asked Bashar about this many years ago, he said, there are many ways of seeing and you see very well this way. Kayla said she's happy to teach me additional ways of experiencing their timeline and the energy waves she is sending, uh, sending are to enable me to see in their higher vibrational reality organically the same way I see when I'm at home. I'm now immersed in these waves of energy and although I'm still seeing by feeling, it has heightened this feeling sense that is clearer than ever before. Then Kayla says to look around the tavern and tell her what I see. I told her I see a very tall and large being over by the bar talking to the stargazer barkeep. The being looks to be a male around eight to nine feet tall, bald, <clears throat> has yellowish skin. Since stargazers have the ability to change their size, shape, and nature, and their normal height is usually a little over five feet tall, I, got, I get to witness her growing to his height and to hold a conversation with him. He begins to sit down, and am I, I'm aware that the bar stools can intuitively adjust to accommodate each patron. I saw the bar itself adjust to his height so he could sit comfortably. So just one part of the bar, the one where he was sitting, is now higher than the rest of it. Also, the barkeep has lowered her height to match his. This is fascinating to see. I'm looking around the tavern again. I see what appears to be two male and one female hybrids spontaneously setting up their instruments in the far right corner of the room to provide some music. I recognize one of the instruments that looks similar to our keyboards, but it is translucent. It looks like glass. I ask Lily if she plays any musical instruments. She said she plays an interdimensional nanoglass one that in our timeline looks like a piano and inside there are multicolored energy waves dancing around where many levels of musical notes that we don't have in our timeline can be used to compose beautiful melodies. Lily reminds me that the keyboard and her, and her piano are made of the same nanoglass, Bashar said. <clears throat> then I put in nano, nanotechnology now, this is nanoglass, nanotechnology that is made of a type of glass that can change form. It can absorb energies of certain qualities and certain resonances for certain for specific purposes and shift as it needs to in real time to handle the fluctuations going on in the energy fields that you generate. It's new form of it's a new form of containment, a response of real time containment. Now, Willa Hillcrossing has mentioned. Uh, and I, I point, uh, she pointed out, had mentioned uh, when uh, she spoke of nano of nano cubes. Okay, uh, the nano glass nano cubes are the ones Willa's uh, team 
of 33 parallel reality specialists use. I didn't mention that uh, also Lily is uh, on the Willis team. Anyway, <clears throat> nanocubes, are, nanocubes are the ones Willis team of 33 parallel reality specialists, specialists use to make the pin charts. Those are parallel incarnation charts. They pr provide that are equivalent to what we recognize as computers. And Lily is on Willis' team of the 33 parallel reality specialists, and there's only 33. So these nano, they're, uh, I'm, I'm not reading at the moment, I'm telling you that the nano glass is their, uh, like their computers, okay, in their timeline. She said that unlike the hybrid playing the keyboard, his is not multi-dimensional, and he uses his hands to play it. She can use her hands, but also use her hands-free telekinetic ability to play her piano instrument. I turned my attention back to the bar because I saw another yellowish being the same size and stature as the first one. Only this one is female with sh shoulder length green colored hair. She is actually quite a striking being to behold. I told Lily that I would like to go over to the bar and talk with them. She said not at this time as this as the reason for this visit was to begin to perceive what is going on in the tavern through new eyes. So we hugged and and ended the visit. Well, that's a lot of information. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Sorry about that. <laughs> you thinking back about this particular visit to the end? Uh huh. What do you what do you think about that particular visit? What did, what it, what part of that visit kind of uh, either sticks in your mind or is the most prominent or the part that you're never going to forget or you know what I'm saying what's the highlight of that visit what was the oh I think uh, finding out because I've never asked Lily before if she plays an instrument um, you know asking about that and I knew uh, back in 2013 when Willa had told us when she first started uh, coming through Bashar and uh uh, she told us about the uh, nano glass uh, that they use uh, to do um, to chart um, the lives. Uh, that's what that's one of the things they do. They chart the lives uh, even in their timeline and everything. Uh, and, and they they use what is called these pin charts. And you can see uh, on the charts. Um, uh, where your past, you, know, you will do past and future, but where all your lives are that you've had, uh, all your connections through your life. But in their nano glass, what we would refer to think of it as the computer, in there they have, uh, they see at at, at uh, dimensional different. They see your lives at dimensional different dimensional uh, levels. Uh, through their nanoglass. So that I knew about the nanoglass from back at that time. Uh, but this, uh, when I asked her about it, and so this was using the nanoglass in a different way. And uh, the fact that, uh, you know, everything is so vibrant and, and so energetic. I mean, it just, uh, everything at the end, I mean, it just, it's, it's energy is just dancing. I mean, you, you see it, it's, it's, uh, uh, you feel it. Uh, and it's all unconditional love. So if you're not visual, but yet you can see the by feeling, you, but don't you know how to describe that. <laughs> but you said you actually see these things. So. Oh, I yeah. In order to be able to, I if I couldn't have seen it, I wouldn't have been able to write what I just wrote. Right. I, I'm not doubting what you're saying. All I'm yeah. doing is try. You try were saying that you're not a visual. You tend to feel things. Yeah. I, I, I'm just wondering how somebody who's not very visual gets from their normal state of not being visual to the point where they can actually see the end. It's a, you know, the be there visually. Because uh, I, I think they, you can realize, because you can use your imagination, you know, imagination is real. Some people think that it isn't real, but imagination is real reality. Okay. And everybody has imagination. So uh, if you, when, when I give you the description of the inn, you could pretty most people. I mean, they don't have a uh, they don't have a problem with seeing the inn, uh, you know, from the description and that. Uh, they it might come together and they might see the bar portion of it first, 
you know, and then as your eyes acclimate, then they might see the huge fireplace in the back of the room and, and, uh, you know, the tables and all this kind of stuff comes into focus. It might come into, uh, uh, take them a little time to come in focus. But I think when you like, when I had told Bashar years ago, uh, I said, geez, I'd really like to be able to see in pictures, you know? And uh, he said, there's more than one way of seeing, just like what I mentioned in this. And uh, because he said, you see very well, and I have through the years with feeling. Uh, I can just project something in my mind. Now, maybe it's visual, and I'm not calling it that, but... Uh, well, uh, so, some people see through their eyes. Some people... Yeah, through your uh, eyes. Hold on, let me finish. Some people see through their eyes with their eyes open. Other people can close their eyes and they can, like, for instance, I had uh, some Hemisync, um, Robert Monroe's Hemisync. I'm familiar with those, yeah. Yeah, so I had one of those I was listening to, and I guess it opened my either my third eye or my psychic ability. And I, I was sitting on the couch with my eyes closed, but I thought, I had my eyes open because I was seeing the room even though my eyes were closed and it looked like a normal room to me. And I got up, I started to walk across the room and I realized that I had the headphones on and they were hooked to the uh, the tape player that was still sitting there on the couch. Mm -hmm. So I was seeing psychically. So that's another way of seeing. That's another way of seeing through your mind's right. eye. Yeah, people so, see that way. So, there, so it isn't just like, oh, my God, it's visual. Now, I have had experience um, one time uh, visually where I saw I was waking up in the morning and um, I had my eyes closed. But I was seeing this um, like in San Francisco, uh, like, you know, a, a road. And uh, there was this um, horse drawn uh, like streetcar. At, you know, at the time back in what the 1800s or whatever period of time that would be. And so I was seeing this this uh, street and this horse drawn uh, carriage and I saw all in full color, very visually like I was watching TV. And then um, and then uh, I said, oh, and then I thought to myself, hmm, I wonder if I could see if I open my eyes. So I opened my eyes and I could still see it. But now it turned into a. Uh, a streetcar uh, version with it, you know, with the when they had the wires that went down on the rails. So it was in a, another time frame. So I saw it in two time frames. And I did see visually, had my eyes up, both closed and had my eyes open. But I haven't had that type of experience since. Um, although, um, quite a few years ago, I was in a, I was taking a, a class. And we were um, just in a metaphysical where I don't remember what he was teaching, but the uh, instructor at the time sort of surprises. And there was only like about maybe uh, 18 or 20 of us in, in the class. And so he said, I want you to and I didn't know any of these people. I want you everybody to get a partner and then take your chairs and, uh, you know, sit uh, face to face. Um, and so we did that. And then what we had to do was give uh, the person our address. OK, and we all this was in, uh, you know, in the valley in Los Angeles and uh, give give that. And then we were to uh, go there, go to their house. I'd never done this before. And so I went first and she gave me her address. I was outside of her house. I saw. Uh, exactly what her house looked like. And now I'm describing, you had to describe it to it so that, you know, the person can acknowledge it. And so I'm describing what her house looks like. And she's saying, yes. And I'm walking up to the door and I open the door and I go through. And I, so I'm telling her, I said, okay, you take a right. And so you're into the family room. I describe the furniture in the family room, uh, you know, and then I walk into the, uh, the kitchen and I describe everything there. I see a sliding glass door that goes outside and then I'm walking uh, you know, the living room, the dining room, and then I'm walking into the bedrooms. And the last uh, bedroom was a, a child's bedroom. I'm describing uh, the little flowers on the wall and the furniture and, and the whole thing. That was, uh, that was like, um, what would you call it, the remote viewing. 
Yeah, that's one version uh, of yeah. a review. Uh, but yeah, or so whatever you want to call it. When you take your client, uh, when Lily takes your well, you don't take them. You you actually project yourself there to the end. Well, however it's done. Yeah, you take yourself there. Yeah. Okay, so um, you get on the phone with your client, and Lily's talking to them, and she has them take themselves to the the end. The end. Tavern. Uh huh. Okay, so. Um, since you're not a client of yourself, you cannot be. How do you believe that the client is getting to the end? Are they psychically seeing it? Are they imagining it? How how is how are they getting from not seeing the end to being there? What is the mechanism? Do they all know? have their own their own mechanisms. Like what we'll, we see, some people are very visual, like Patrick. I mean, very, very, very visual. Okay. He didn't have one problem whatsoever. My group was very, very visual. I mean, just, you know, but they are very visionary people. And then uh, there are other people that see, like you said, in the mind's eye. And then there's people like my see, like myself who see by feeling. So they get there and, and for whatever method that they are able to see. And by using, I think the thing is the description. Like I said, when you, when you read exactly what the end looks like, you can picture it. I mean, if I'm just reading in a book about what the what a room looks like or or anything, I mean, that's what's so great about books is that, you know, use your imagination. And so they can use their imagination, uh, you know. To get there by by knowing what the where they're going, if they didn't know where they were going and it'd be like, who could see anything, you know, but this is such a description that I I provide for them. Uh, you know, down to the, the flooring is and 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 where everything is placed and what it looks like. And, and you, send that to, you send that to them before. You get yes. Started. Yes. As soon as they say they want to go to the inn, they're providing with how to um, how to, uh, you know, prepare themselves to go to the inn. Like I said, if you're into I'm not a meditator at all, but if you're into meditation, if if you then you already know. Uh, you know, if you've signed up three, four days or a week or a month or whatever ahead of time, uh, soon as as you uh, are signed up, uh, then I send you that and that prepares you for it. So it's like reading a book. You know exactly where you're going. You know exactly what it looks like. OK. Uh, yeah. Is there anything else you want to tell the the uh, audience before i really appreciate you being on the show it was uh, very nice and uh, um it would be nice to talk to one of your clients that would be cool but uh regardless um well when i read the one from patrick that's like talking to him because that was his experience sure yeah that's so, his complete experience do you how he wrote to, it up is there any other story you want to tell or, or experience you've had I mean, I, I'll be happy to listen to any <laughs> number of experiences that you've had. Well, we could we could go on all day with my experience and some of the other people's experiences, but uh, whatever you think you want to tell is, well, you know, I don't, I'm not trying to get push you down a road that you don't want to go. Whatever you feel is appropriate or important, or um, you know, would help people or whatever. You know, it's all good for what, me. What are you going to do with all this information? <laughs> it's all going. It's all going to get uh, posted on YouTube as soon as I get through. Oh the- yeah, that's going to be a pretty. When we've been talking, I uh, think two and a half hours. Yeah. Well, <laughs> it, it, I've listened. To, I've got one I'm listening to on TV right now. I've I've listened to pieces of it. I've it's three and a half hour interview. And uh, I plan on listening to the whole thing. It's, uh, wow. Because most people these days, I don't think, uh, put that much time into uh, listening. Well, it, listening it all depends things. on how interesting the interview is. If the if it's something I want to hear or something that's interesting to me, I'll just listen to it as off and on. You know, I'll listen to like the nightly news or whatever in the 
between it and, uh, you know, like I'll listen to as much as I can last night till I got tired. Then this morning I got up and listened to a little, little bit of it. And then on the way to and from the park, my wife and I listened to the nightly news because she, she's not necessarily wanting to hear what I want to hear. Yeah. Uh, so we watched, we listened to that together to and from the park. And then when I get back, had I uh, wanted, felt like doing it, I could have asked, listen to a little more of it. And I, when I get off of here, as I'm uploading this on to YouTube, I will downloading it, then uploading it to YouTube. I will watch a little more of it and then I'll do some more tomorrow and I'll keep going on it as long as it, as long as it doesn't get boring in the middle of the, <laughs> you know, conversation, I'll keep going with it. Cause, um, some of the people, you know, if, if, if I've stayed over an hour, then obviously it's interesting to me if I've stayed that long, cause I can drop off real quick. You know, <laughs> I, I'll listen to stuff on YouTube and I'll, I'll be into it like two or three minutes. I'm like, eh, this isn't for me. And I'll, I don't stay very long, but, uh, I'll, if it's long, it doesn't bother me that it's long. It's, it's not a matter of the length. It's a matter of how interesting it is to hear. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I, I found your conversation interesting all the way through. You haven't bored me yet. Well, very uh, good. Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, well, let me read one. I'll read one of, um, another uh, client tom okay and this was in february this year and this will give you uh, another um experience because he sees things in his mind's eye that we were talking about okay okay so he says i greatly enjoyed my session this is his testimonial about his visit i greatly enjoyed my session at the tavern in the stargazer inn lily stargazer guided me through the double doors in my mind's eye once i see myself in the tavern Lily asks if I can see her waving at me. And to my surprise, I literally, literally do see her waving to me. We settle into a table and one of the stargazers asks what I'd like to drink. I request a bubbly lime water, something I enjoy in my physical life. Lily's drinks are designed to enhance and stabilize the experience. With that, I begin to settle more deeply into the space-time coordinate some hundred, 700 years in the future. As I settle in, Lily asks me, look around and tell me what you see. That's her standard, what she does. He, she, he says, everything starts to flow easily and naturally, save for occasional self-imposed inhibitions and in revealing my inner world out loud into the recording. I describe the scene unfolding before my eyes. The first being that appears is a Sasani counterpart. Com communication with beings in the tavern happens telepathically, that is, both telepathically and emphatically. We communicate with our hearts and minds. While I've communicated with this counterpart before, the contact in this place is more vivid and alive than before. This tavern experience is opening my inner doors of consciousness even further. The counterpart I engage in, I engage in a lovely Excuse me. The counterpart and I engage in a lovely exchange. I'm aware of his somewhat humorous name, Max, which was given to me earlier. Telepathic beings don't have or need names, but we are given names for our own sake since we are so accustomed to using them. Lily prompts me to ask for, and, and Lily, I, I will tell you that Lily engages, she guides you. She doesn't tell you what you're seeing or anything, but she guides you. And so, you know, she will uh, prompt. So that's what he's saying. He, she's, she has now chimed in. So he said, Lily prompts me to ask for more information about his name, about its significance. That's her interplay, how she, she does this. I hear his answer in my mind's eye. It has to do with helping me reach the maximum of my full capacity. I have not grasped the name's significance before. I ask this being, Max, if and when I may channel, I ask this being, Max, if and when I may channel him. His reply is immediate, as soon as you like. The next being that comes in and sits at our table is a counterpart from the Orion days. He's a fighter pilot in the ancient Orion world, part of the Black League. My boyhood fascination with the struggle of the rebellion against galactic empire in Star Wars seems all more obvious now with this connection. 
I see clearly that my oversoul has extensions into that time period, working out this ancient struggle of light, light and dark, of attempting to fight fire with fire. The next being that joins our growing party is a mantis. I've communicated with these in the past as well, and here they are joining us in the tavern. It, be, it becomes more clear that my healing work and teaching are aided and assisted by them as they provide healing and teaching templates for me to transmit to my clients and students. I'm aiding and assisting in genetic and template upgrades in my current time period with their help, support, and guidance. I connect to a younger version of them so as to learn in parallel together. This being grows in understanding as he mentors me in my self-growth. Following the mantis comes a very special being that I've also seen before and am getting to know better now. She is one of the Shalanaya, and what I discovered before is that we share genetic and energetic templates, one of the hybrids. They are related through one of the energetic templates that we are related through genetics. But Lily helps me discover more of our special relationship that was a mystery to me before. It turns out that we are counterparts. This makes total sense, and I'm surprised I had not guessed it before. What is more, this beautiful being shows me her fluid energy form, or what I sometimes refer to as the rainbow body. I see her as a spirit being, radiant and beautiful energy, rather than her physical self. She is, among other things, helping me, helping me open my heart and will show up in various ways to aid and assist with this in the days and years to come. It's a lively bunch indeed spanning eons from the darkest and most challenging lessons of the Orion days to super bright and luminous future. I see myself as part of this larger tapestry of selves, each experience a facet of the all that is from our unique vantage point. We all support one another in this intricate network web of life and communications, quote, behind the scenes, unquote, even as we each focus in our respective realities. The tavern is a lovely place indeed, and Lily does a fine job of holding space for all these connections to easily and naturally come into focus. I will definitely vis visit the inn again and look forward to the um unfolding of these connections within my current time frame. Thank you, Lily and Ellie, for opening up your space and heart to us. So, um, how'd you like that one? It was good. I mean, I, um, I, I would have to actually hear it a second time to even remember. Okay, so there was the, um, uh, the mantis. Uh, that's the one. One of the things that stood out. Mm -hmm. the, um, it sounded like he had something going on in his life that, that connected to this experience, before he had the experience. Before he right, uh, yeah. And so that the fact that it connected to his life is important. You know, if you have if you anything you experience, if it has a connection to your current life, obviously it's going to have more meaning to you. So that's a good thing. Um, I since I didn't go through the experience personally, I, I can't really comment on how awesome it was. I'm sure it was positive for him because he sounded like he wanted to do it again. So oh that, yeah, yeah. People do come back. Yeah, they they have people who have repeated there, and they get something different from it every time. And like I said, he knew you know he was in touch with or knew of some of these beings, but it just uh, being in the inn, like he said, it just you know brought it more to light uh, for him. So how many and, times, uh, relatively speaking, how many times have you personally gone to the inn? Oh God, I don't know. I've got them all. I started going. Hundreds? Oh, I don't know. I don't think there's, I don't know if there's a hundred or not. Probably. So less than a hundred. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I was going uh, when I first started out in 2019, where uh, before I started channeling uh, her for other people to go to the inn, uh, when she was teaching me uh, to see. Uh, so I would go, we do it like a, uh, two, three times a week. And uh, we didn't, they weren't anything like what I'm talking about now. They were just brief visits that was just to, to show me around. And I wasn't meeting anybody, uh, you know, that I was, 
like I said, my biggest thing was uh, meeting Dr. Simon, but um, the 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 it grew. But then I I stopped uh, I stopped going to the inn for some time when I was because I got you know caught up. I mean, you only have so many hours in a day, right. and uh, you know I'm working with three different uh, channels and doing that for other people. So I stopped going to the inn, and then I started going back uh, again. Actually, um, probably this year uh, from the ones that I told you about that are now the trips to the inn. Well, ever since Dr. Simon, uh, you know, my experience with that in the Tesseract. And, and then in January, I met, uh, uh, I met Valia, who uh, I told you is Willa's uh, counterpart self. And, my, and Jacinta is my counterpart, uh, the daughter, the counterpart. And I met her at the inn. And I met her uh, through the triangle. Remember I told you there, there were nine... Uh, uh, geometric symbols. I met uh, Dr. Simon uh, through the tesseract. Well, I met her through the triangle because she has a triangular shape. Ship. Um, so, outside of your channeling and outside of your uh, work with your clients, how has all of this? all these connections to the people that you channel and the work that you do, how, how has this sort of spread out into the rest of your life, if at all, that, that's not exactly, you know, in other words, uh, you're, you're not, and on a given point in your day, you're not channeling, you're not working with a client, but you're just going about your normal day that's that's not those things. Has, how, has this at all affected that part of who you are oh yeah i mean i i just cannot imagine uh, my life uh without uh you know like i said i i've got a what i call my spiritual team uh i also to tell you that um i channel my uh husband uh who died 10 years ago uh, oh Fred. i didn't know that yeah, yeah, and he's he's my he's uh, turned out to be my um, uh, oh what I turned to he's a a special guide for me. Okay, so he's there, and so with Fred, it's like um, we talk every day. I mean, it our my my life goes not that I'm clinging. So don't get this wrong. I'm not clinging to my life with him. He's been gone for 10 years. We had a beautiful right. 23 years together. Okay. okay. But um, he's the one that, uh, you know, I talk to. And it's almost like he isn't, uh, he's just gone physically. That's all. We watch TV together. Uh, you know, he drives with me. I go to my hairdresser. And he's had a great sense of humor. And and uh, get my nails done. And I get... Uh, you know, and he laughs and we talk about what color uh, nails is he going to get? I mean, just, you know. Uh, so has he told you anything about the other side? Yeah, I've channeled uh, a lot of people from the other side. Uh, in fact, I acted as a medium for about a year back in 1990, what, 19? I've got a lot of different experiences. So what, uh, what do you, what do you in know in general? What do you know about the other side? Well, it's um, fantastic. It's beautiful. They can uh, they can be uh, whoever they want. They can go wherever they want. He now I'll talk about Fred. Um, in order to be my you know spiritual guide, um, very personal spiritual guide. He then they have to know everything that you you know everybody that you know. And, and in touch with that. And so he knows, well, he had uh, witnessed Bashar, you know, when he was physical too. But I mean, he knows Lily, he knows everybody uh, that I'm in contact with and he can go there. He's visited, uh, you know, he's gone to the Enlightenment Center and, and met with Dr. Simon and, and uh, you know, and they have, he has his own, uh, they have their own things that they're interested in. Uh, it, it's, I think it can be like physical life, 
Uh, they can have a whole, you know, they have a whole life depending on what their interests are. And it's a, it's a thought form within a thought form. The moment you, uh, when I have channeled people, not him, but when I've channeled people uh, who, um, for them, and they had said that, uh, and this were people that weren't really into, you know, all of this when they died, but I was doing, I used to do, uh, as a medium, I used to do, uh, I'd have, um, a, a client submit, uh, they could submit five questions. This, I wasn't voice channeling at all. This was back in 1991, I think it was. And, uh, I would do automatic writing. So they would give me the questions that they wanted to ask their loved one who had passed. And then I would ask that those questions and there was a lot of writing with each question. So five questions could turn out to be pages and pages. And then I would, you know, send that to them. Um, but one of one of them, uh, this Carl, who we did, we called it Love Letters from Carl, because uh, she, uh, sh- his wife, um, contacted me and talked with him quite a bit. But his thing was when he first over, and I've heard this before too, that because you're a thought form in in a thought form, and in, 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 everything is instantaneous. We have time because time then gives us our choice. If we didn't have time, then we would manifest everything instantaneously like they do on the other side. Okay. And so our, our great, which I think is a gift is let's say that I wanted to, I'm watching TV and I decided, Oh, I think I want a banana. So I get up and go into the kitchen. And when I get to the kitchen, okay, then I see an apple and I think, oh, okay, so I choose an apple. And that that's what time gives us. Time gives us to have the choice and the experience. But when you're on the other side, especially when you first go over, he said that they he had to learn uh, actually how to uh, you know, control, because if you're thinking of a storm and, you know, it could storm and whatever you're thinking of is instantaneous uh, manifestation. So that's always interesting. Um, I So Fred is the one that I talk with all the time. Uh, I have a son that died seven years ago. Um, I don't communicate with him a lot, but I've communicated. I have, uh, remember the husband I told you that I did, um, uh, we always kept in touch. Uh, we were married for 10 years. And then I did uh, the Ouija board with, remember I told you on the vacation? Yes. Yeah. Well, he just died uh, two years ago. I didn't know that he had died at the time, but Social Security had uh, contacted me and and uh, said, oh, he died. But I didn't know what date he died. I knew it was in July. It'll be uh, the 19th of this month will be two years ago. Um, so. Two years ago, he died and it wasn't until last year, so a year after he had been dead. OK. I knew he was dead two years ago, but uh, it was last year on the July 19th. I'm sitting at my computer and doing something, and all of a sudden I hear. Now, he had a song for me uh, and that he had chosen. It was called, it's by Bread, and it's called I Want to Make It With You. And many, 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 many years ago when we first met, okay? And hadn't thought about that song in forever. Uh, and so all of a sudden that song is in my mind and this is how they contact you. Okay. The sound is uh, the song and now I'm humming the song. I want to make it with you. So I knew that was Gary. And so I sat down and we wrote a couple pages, uh, automatic writing. Um, and you know, he told me, uh, about experience and, and so now I knew that he had died of a heart attack. I didn't know any of that. Um, so that's how, you know, some of how they contact you. That was a, a nice uh, to talk with him. Um, but Gary is, uh, Gary, uh, Fred is with me, like I said, all the time. It's like he's not physical. But then I, I have my others. I, I talk to Dr. Simon. Uh, if I've got uh, a pain in my leg or whatever, I say, oh, Dr. Simon, can you work with that? You know, and sometimes he'll do it on the fly, you know. Um, Lily. Uh, you know, I, I don't, I'll, I'll chat with her now and then it just depends. I, I chat with the different ones. Uh, Zytec, I was talking to him the other day, uh, just all telepathically. It just, uh, uh, that's what's so great about telepathic. You know, you can be doing anything in your life and, and, uh, you can have nice great conversations with them. 
Well, I had my father come through once when I had my wife in a trance. She, as a hypnotherapist, he spoke um, one phrase, and I knew it was him. And that's the only time I've ever talked with anybody who's been on the other side, or who is 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 on the other side. So that's kind of un- unique for me to have that experience. Whereas you, it's it's no big deal. It's an everyday thing. Yeah. Well, also uh, years ago, not so much anymore today, but uh, my friends, uh, you know, and uh, and their husbands or boyfriends or you know whatever, of course, knew uh, that I, you know, would channel people who had passed. And um, uh, I remember this this one uh, this one time I'm I'm with. Now she wasn't a real close friend of mine. She was an acquaintance. I knew her husband Dave more than I knew her. Because he used to always um, be at the uh, Westlake Inn, the bar that we used to go dancing and and everything too. So Dave had cancer. Now I did go see him uh, when he was uh, fairly about a month before he died, and that, and uh, visited him in his home and everything. So anyway, we're at his gravesite, and Dave is now talking to me. He is monitoring uh, everything that's going on. He's talking to me, and I'm relaying the messages to her. So that's always uh, uh, fun, but they, because they know that I can do this. And so I've channeled uh, just, you know, somebody will come through and uh, channel through to give a message. Uh, and, and that's it. I mean, we don't go on. There's no reason to go on more than that, but it's a, you know, a one-time thing sort of. Because everything is consciousness, you know, we're all made of energy and we can tap into anything. I've talked to birds and ducks and, and a grasshopper and, uh, you know, you, I just have telepathic communication with them. They tell me, you know, the one duck told me about his life one time, you know, and he's going around on the, on the pond while I was sitting there. So, and when you realize that everything is just consciousness and we're all, you know, we're all connected. Um, so what did the duck say about his life? Oh, God, I don't know. that was 40 years ago. <laughs> So you don't remember the ducks? Oh life? my God, Come no, on. no. <laughs> and it was just a very short, very short couple sentence uh, conversation. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, it's been a pleasure having you on the show. Well, I've, thank you. I've enjoyed for it. Me. Is there anything else you want to tell the audience <laughs> before we? Uh, you know, come see me or whatever. You know, what 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 do you want? Uh, your website is down here. I should I should mention it, or is it? Let me hold on a second. Let me go down to the bottom. My notes. Uh, no, it's not. So you have a website? Okay. So I have Facebook pages uh, for each one. So uh, you just do a search for Ellie Keith? And no, Facebook. you can do with Lily. It's um, Her Facebook page is called Lily Stargazer Inn. So just do a Google search for In Lily Facebook, Stargazer Inn. Yeah, Lily. You can go up to, uh, in Facebook, you can just go up to, uh, you know, the, the if search. you want to put in www and just put uh, uh, Lily Stargazer in. And it'll take you to her page. Right. And then with Dr. Simon, his page is called uh, Energy Healing from the Future. Dot com? Dot com. Mm-hmm. They're both dot coms, yeah. Lilies.com. And do you have any other? Yeah, I have one for, for Dr. Michaels. And Dr. Michaels is a energy healing vet from the future. Is there any other thing you want to mention? Uh, you know, this is your time to promote your uh, ways of people contacting you. Well, they can they can go through that. They can email me uh, at Ellie Keith. E-L-L-E-K-E-I-T-H at M-S-N dot com. They can call me. I don't know if you want to give your number out on the air. but Okay, then. Uh, That's up to you. It, it, up to it's, you. it's in, it's I mean, in, you, it, I, I have it, uh, uh, you know, on their pages and everything, what my telephone number is. Okay, well, I mean, if you want to give it out, you can. I'm, I'm not telling you not to do it. I, it's up to you. So, uh, but anyway, uh, it's been a pleasure. If uh, there's anything else you want to say before we 
in the recording, go, you should uh, not be shy. Well, come. Uh, oh, another thing that uh, yeah, I do want to mention with uh, Lily. Um, I told, I think I told you that, uh, or did I tell you? You can tell me this. Uh, for the first three years that I met her, she was working with people with their beliefs. I think I told you that. Yeah. Okay. So, and then uh, when we start going to the inn, all right, then uh, Dr. Simon took over and then he's been working with people. So now we're coming back to uh, offering, in addition to going to the inn, okay, uh, offering sessions. And it's going to be, I haven't put this out yet, uh, but it's like, come, come dine with Lily. Uh, because the the inn is a place where you meet, you can come talk to her, uh, you know, discuss everything with her. She'll tell you uh, uh, with like the inn is for it's it's a hub, and then people go there. They'll talk. They'll share share their stories with Lily. And she can be of help with them in, in many ways. Uh, <clears throat> so she can help you. She was working for three years, helping many, many people by uh, working with uh, breaking free from their limiting core beliefs and helping realize their potential in life. Uh, change your change your belief. You change your life. You change your reality. Okay. And so now uh, she's going to offer that again and you can do it one or two ways you can just have a regular session with her over the phone or you can dine with her at the inn and so i'm going to be putting out an invitation to dine with lily at the inn and you can come and talk about uh things going on in your life we had the <clears throat> the first session uh just this thursday uh for going back to uh, working with the beliefs again and uh it was uh it was quite phenomenal so your rates are all on your website? No, they they can contact me for it. Oh, okay. So you just tell them over the phone. Yeah. Okay. All right. Well, uh, it's been a pleasure. Um, you anything else you want to say before we end this? No. Is there anything you want to to know about or? No, nah, I'm. I think I'm good at the moment. Yeah. I, I, I what I'll do is I'll think in. of something as soon as we're done. <laughs> <laughs> I want to ask it, but I can't think of anything at the moment. Well, think. we've talked a long time, so you've done <clears throat> done great, and uh, and uh, you know you're such a great listener and <clears throat> and interesting. And I I was uh, it was fun to find out your experience, and uh, you know when you talked about that too. So uh, thank you for having me on. I appreciate it. Well, thank you for being on. Uh, I look, I. Um, Wish you the best of luck with all of your efforts, and let me go ahead and stop the recording. Okay. All right.